don't know if it's showing up as live on your end. Now we do it. Welcome everybody to the Impaired Files number 17 with the Nerdy Chicano. Today is a wonderful, wonderful Friday night and it is another day in quarantine, another day as we wait for electoral election results, but we're here for another episode of the Impaired Files, but today is a little bit different. First of all, you may notice that we are live on twitch.tv slash denerdcore. That is true. We are now live on Twitch for all our shows. Uh, this one is back for a special. Hopefully, com it's coming back because it's coming back. But today it's back for one night as of right now because we hit our goal over at BeforeILeafFilm.com to get funded. And one of our many goals was that I would fast track an episode that I think a lot of you were looking forward to. And that is my Impaired Files episode. This was supposed to happen at episode 50, but it's happening at episode 17. And I know what you're saying. Wait, it was supposed to be Brad at 49, Raul at 50, and then someone, somebody after 50, you know, whatever. But um, it seems that the, the stars were aligned because we got funded. And I said, you know what? We're going to fast track this because we're here to do the thing known as an interview. And uh, today, none other than my one of my best friends in the world, the man who has been steady sailing the ship with me for four years and has been doing the absolute most possible work in his being to make this possible. Brad, AK Young Yoda, is going to be here to host this interview, and we're going to get deep into myself. But um, without a further ado, Brad, I think it's time for me to hand you over the microphone privileges. All right, Ro. And um, everyone watching, I know you've probably seen me on the live show on multiple shows. And mm -hmm. that is comedic, Brad. This this I'm actually taking serious for once in my life. So um, for this one, I do plan on being serious. I've only been serious on one other episode during this whole podcast. That was another episode with Raul. And uh, I plan on doing the same thing with this one. So, Roll, thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview you. It is a great honor. And my episode will still probably be number 49 just because we're like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, for people who may not know The Impaired Files, The Impaired Files is my interview show where I talk to content creators, artists, and everybody in between people that I know in my life and people I want to talk to and get to know deeper. And uh, I've got to say that this show is one of people's favorites. I mean, Brad, you're no, uh, you're, you're no, you're, you're not shy about it. This is your favorite show on the this network. Is, this is my favorite show on the network because I'm not on it. Yeah. And, Brad <laughs> and, and Raul is actually a very good interviewer. Yeah. So for me to actually have to take the reins here, it's the I, I've been kind of stressing about this for like all week. <laughs> Not yeah. gonna lie. Our good old Aiden is in the comments, so thank you for stopping by. We want to thank everybody who's gonna be able to stop by today. And uh yeah. appreciate you all. Yeah, I'm I'm what's it called? Um so I wanna go ahead and um start. Well, you know, we can we can start whenever you want. I'm gonna go ahead and tweet out the link. So okay. uh, Brad, you want to tell them a little bit of who you are and what you've been doing here on the network for the past couple of years? Uh, my name is Brad, aka Young Yoda, just like the nameplate says right there. And yeah, I've been basically co-host when I wandered here on episode three. 
was it episode three row or episode four? Episode three. Episode three, I wandered in one day and never left, um, either to Raul's amusement or chagrin. I don't know. Um, but I have enjoyed every minute of it for the most part. There have been moments, probably not as enjoyable as others, but I'm glad to be able to do this and to podcast. And also to stream now with all of you. And if you didn't know, I, well, if you've never listened to an episode of this, you have no idea who we are. Yeah, And you have no idea that we have probably close to 700 and something episodes, probably closer to 800 episodes total on the network. And a fair share of those, either myself or, or both of us have been on. Yeah. Uh, so for, for Andrew, who's asking in the chat, Andrew, this is not the live show today, bro. We're doing my interview about me that we, that was a goal for us because we hit our, um, our goal for the uh, funding on the short film. So uh, live show will be back tomorrow. More than likely Brad is hosting tomorrow. I have to go do some production stuff, but that will happen tomorrow. And uh, I tweet out, I tweeted out the link, Brad, everything is going on. We're getting ready here. And um, so you, are you prepared? Ro? You, you good. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm good. I have my water. Like we always use, uh, there's, there's a, there's a Patreon companion to this, but that will be done. After the live show after, with Raul. What's it called? We'll, we'll do that an, another another day. I want to say like probably like tomorrow or Sunday. Sunday more than likely when we can actually sit down and stream it for the patrons. But um, yeah, um, there's another show called After Hours with the Nerdy Chicano. That is the Patreon companion of the Impaired Files where the guest speaks about one specific topic that they want to talk about. Which I guess we'll end up doing for this one too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's gonna happen on either Sunday or yeah, Sunday. one of those. Yeah. So that's good. And everyone, for everyone's, uh, I guess, knowledge, I have technically eighteen questions that I have, but as the interview goes on, that may span more and more. Mm -hmm. Just to let you guys know, this is probably gonna be a two hour plus episode. Yeah, more than likely. So buckle in, roll. You good? I'm good, bro. I got my water. Um, I, of course, you know, we have a trusted, uh, comer oh crap. I don't have the file on here. So yeah, we're just gonna have to keep going. Yeah. All right. All right. So I, I guess for everyone, um, let's just start out and, uh, roll. Tell me a little bit about yourself and why we're sitting here today. Well, um, if this is the first time you've ever stumbled upon a podcast on this network, um, then, I should probably introduce myself. Um, my name is Raul Alejandro Mendoza Diaz, or just Raul, Raul Alejandro Mendoza. Um, I am the creator of this podcast network. Uh, I started it in November 27, November 7, no, no, I'm sorry, September 7th, 2017, with my friend Luis Gerardo Garcia. Um, and we were concentrating on movie news and movie reviews. And then around December, I know not December, no, like around November is when I brought in Brad and Brad came in as full time. And um, other than, you know, doing podcasting, I am also a filmmaker and photographer. I am an ex radio host over at, um, at a radio station that I cannot name because then you would find out where I live and, then I <laughs> and where the school is. Yeah. Although, although I will admit the radio show was pretty good, except uh, for the behind the scenes part of it. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I'm a filmmaker. I have, um, I have, wow, I should probably count this. Uh, what's it called? I believe six, five. Uh, so it was a mortal, it's a mortal bloodline killing you um, beyond the river in search of the outlaw. And, and this will be your six. And this will be number six. This is short film number six. But you I, have edited and you have done, a f which is posted on your YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have, of course, if you don't count the, the projects I have done right now for school, then this would probably be number nine. Let's be honest. Yeah. Like around number nine. Uh, but, you know, if we're looking at the specific filmography right now of my short films that I've done, then I have only done five. Um, so I'm a short filmmaker right now. I am currently in pre-production for my film before I leave. And um, I mean, for those of you who haven't been here, then I've been what's it called? Uh, plugging the hell out of this thing. Uh, before I leave is a LGBTQ plus uh, drama film about a Latina who takes her best, her 
her uh, her partner disguised as her best friend over to her family dinner and when they get caught being intimate with each other by their by her mother she takes the next couple of days to understand her identity and her sexual orientation and the way that they interact with each other and Raul, uh, i'm going to pause you there because we'll talk about i have qu- specific questions for that so i want to stop you right there and that'll come later in the episode yeah but um oh production big time director over here <laughs> yeah no i i i wish i was a big time director but um we're getting there that, we're getting there yeah we're, other than you know than that yeah you know other than that I, i'm a, i'm an avid gamer um you know i love playing games i love what's it called uh reading and you know just things like that I, i'm a big fan of a i'm a big um, uh, other than before all of these things that precede me my career and stuff the first thing that I am is a um, a cinephile. I'm a lover right. of cinema. I mean, and same here. And I, I think that's why we do so well together. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. That was that was kind of the pre-question question. Mm-hmm. So I'll move on to um, the section I like to call life. Like I have these broken up in sections. Like I really went kind of all out here. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, Again, most uh, people listening to this, where you're a film student and a director, I, here's a softball question. I'll start with a softball question. Mm-hmm. Tell us what movies mean to you. Um, m- movies mean everything. I mean, as you heard it right now, um, before I am before I am a podcaster, before I am a director, before I am a writer, before I am a cinematographer, it doesn't matter. I am a cinephile. And before that, I am Latino. But right now in the in the talks of my career and everything that i've gone through with it and everything i am a cinephile uh movies were there for me when i was unaware of when i wanted what i wanted to do with my life and movies were there for me at a young age to teach me about the magic of the of of art and movies are movies at times is are my escape but at times they're also the lessons that we need to learn about humanity and life in general. Uh, and what are, what are some of the main movies you would suggest for people that have a, truly affected you? The first one that comes to my mind, because we literally just watched it this week, um, 1988's Cinema Paradiso, Cinema Paradiso, uh, directed by Guiso Pitor Um Other with, with that one as well. I also think about uh, Spike Jones, her, um, Michael Gondry's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker, um, 2001 A Space Odyssey from Stanley Kubrick, and um, I'll go to the first movie that ever affected me, even though, you know, I'm, I'm not an avid uh, lover of this company, but I will go back to uh, Bambi. Mm. Yeah. Agreed. Very, very good. Good movies, I think. Quite a few of them we've watched together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> watched together. Uh, moving on to my next question. Many, well, people may or may not be aware of this, but you're also disabled. Mm-hmm. Uh, not really a secret. We're you're pretty open with that. But yeah. I would personally <laughs> like to know how this has affected you throughout your life, including that of being a film director. Yeah. Yeah. Um, being disabled, I mean, it's it's literally in the title of the show, The Impaired Files. It's The Impaired for a reason. Like, like I said, it's not really a secret. It's not a secret, guys. It's what I, I always talk about it. Um, so, you know, my disability has been a part of me for a really, really long time. Um, you know, for a while, I had to, um, you know, not make a big deal of it because I didn't understand the help that I could receive because I was disabled. Uh, but you know, the way it's affected my life, I mean, it's affected the way I work. It's affected the way that I, um, the way that I live, it it definitely affected the way that I interacted with people. You know, it was a thing that I got bullied for a lot in school, uh, you know, especially in middle school, uh, middle school through high school and not really in college, really just when let's go middle, middle school through high school, it was something that, you know, people could latch on to, uh, you know, to what's it called um, uh, um to tease about or really just to uh, make fun of me about um whereas in film 
you know, it, that's an interesting question that you bring because, you know, um, art and life are two very different things either way, e even though they can interact in one in the same. Um, because there's not a lot of people like me in the industry, I was kind of walking into this career path of mine that I want to take really weird because I'm like, okay, so you have a guy who can barely see out of his eyes who wants to basically look through the viewfinder of a camera most of the time and wants to what's called visualize a scene and be able to, you know, you know, put a camera in focus and stuff like that, you know, and pay, basically command a whole set. And it's, it's kind of odd because usually when people hear that you're disabled, automatically your mind goes somewhere and like thinking that, oh, there is specific limitations with this creative person, even though as much as you all would like to say that, no, I don't think about it like that. I don't think about disabled people like that. It's a thought that goes through everybody's minds. And it's because of the way that we've been brought up in our uh, very ableist society. So it's, it's, it's very odd when I think about, you know, wanting to be a film director and being disabled but I know that if I were to get to the point I want to get to, that I would be making, I would be breaking some barriers as a disabled filmmaker. And do you find that in, I guess your, your film school and all that, do you find like stigmas attached to that? Or is it just something so new that people just don't know how to kind of work with it? I actually have to bring up a, a story um so i'm with one of my mentors and um and you know it was something really silly like you know he was telling me it was kind of like a joke but it was something that i looked at it i was like oh this guy really doesn't think about my disability at all it's like you know when i was in my tv production class i had my cane and i was walking around the you know you know the the, the studio with it and uh, my other my mentor said to me i told him um, I, I show them my pictures and I, and I kind of tell them the joke that I tell everybody wouldn't think that a, uh, I said, you wouldn't think that a disabled person could, could take a picture like this. Right. And he was like, no, of course you can. I mean, you've got a viewfinder that you can focus. And I was like, at that time, the funny thing about that story is because I didn't know that my viewfinder was out of focus. Uh, I was, I always thought that it was just my eyes. I was like, oh crap, I guess you can't really make the viewfinder that well. Uh, little to know that I kept scrolling the thing and I was like, oh crap, my viewfinder, it, you can actually see clearly out of the viewfinder. <laughs> I was like, okay, thanks man. Uh, but you know, there, there's on a set when you're with people who, you know, at least in my classes, when you're with people who respect you and who understand your hard work, they see past that disability because at this point, everybody is always like, Hey, what's up? Bro? Nobody even looks at the cane anymore. You know, yeah. no one looks at the cane. It's just, it's a simple me coming into class and they're like, Hey, what's going on, man? And it's like, oh, no, no, nothing about the cane, you know, you yeah, get in, I, I, basically get into work. Yeah. You're basically going in, you know, what's it called? But you know, one of the fun things is like, even when, you know, the only time they'll, they'll you know, they'll, they'll notice the cane is when I, you know, play around with them and I joke around that I'm going to hit them if they keep, you know, talking back, like talking back to me like that or something, you know, like, yeah, I can use this cane for something else. But wow. you know, at first I will say that people did look at me a lot, you know, when, especially with my, with my, with my classmates that I have right now, you know, the ones that I've been with since for like two, three semesters now, um, you know, they, 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 they saw the cane and they obviously reacted a certain way to the cane, but it was after a while, like, you know, they just forgot that it was there and they were just like, yeah, this guy kind of just works kind of like us. There's just a specific limitation to him. Just don't turn off the lights, but you know, in, in the, in the, in the, in the work that, that, you know, Luis is in the chat in the work that Luis and ourselves are, um, are pursuing the lights have to be off at most of the time mm. in the studio. So, yeah. So, so when, when you were suggesting you would hit people with your canes, are you, are you more of a Stanley Kubrick kind of director? <laughs> No, no, not at all. You know, it, that's always something that we discuss on the show. We're always like on the on the main show. We're like everybody's always like, "Oh, this this guy is the new Stanley. The new Stanley. This is the new Stanley." And they're like, "the the, the real thing is that the uh, the industry will never allow for someone like that ever again." No, no, you get um, real quick. They actually have HR departments now. Yeah, we actually have HR departments who don't care uh, about the notoriety status of your. Uh, of your um of your what's it called uh of, of your director title you know yeah. but um yeah it's 
it, yeah, no, I'm not understanding. I'm I'm a very um I'm a very communicative director. At least I would like to think so. I I I don't like to not talk to my cast and crew. Like I I um I say hi to everybody. I, I make sure I talk with everybody. Um, and that's something that even though right now my my crew size are pretty small and minimal, and it's people that I know, people I, I talk to a lot. Even if when I get to the point where I get to be in a large crew, I would still like to say hi to everybody. I think that's the most respectful thing to do, especially if you're working with them. Yeah. Because uh, well, filmmaking is a um, it's a team based, you know, what's it called? A work. You know, if 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 everybody's not comfortable with each other, we're not gonna work. We're not gonna work well. It's it's a we're all little gears on this machine that are trying to work with each other to kind of make the machine move and work mm -hmm. properly. So if one gear is not working properly or the one gear does not want to work because something in that machine is not allowing that thing to work, it's never going to work out. I feel like that's in most entertainment businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with podcasting, you notice that too. If we bring on someone and it's just, it's not quite working, it kind of just gets just off the rails quite a bit. So I get that. Yeah. Um. Okay. So my third question in the life category, yes, I have categories, um, is a bit of a heavier topic. So just to warn you, and you, you said you're up. My friend. Talk about it's anything. So it's raw. It's unfiltered. Everything gets brought up. Usually, when I start this episode, these episodes, I, I tell them, "Hey, if there's something that I'm asking and you don't and you don't feel comfortable answering, we'll go ahead and move past it. You just tell me." In my case, we're gonna go. We're gonna go with the flow. We're gonna go. All right. Leave it up in here. So let's go ahead and discuss because you have brought this up many podcast episodes, many times to me yeah. through the years. Let's discuss your mental health and just what effect it has had on you throughout everything, really. And uh, also, if you will broach this topic, uh, will you ever broach this topic in future films or screenwritings that you'll do? Um, I think that you might see a little bit of it in before I leave, um, you know, um, and, it, it, you know, I, I can't expect the actress to, you know, approach it the way that I want them to approach it. But I do put a little bit of me on every single script that I write and every movie that I make, every short film that I make. And I think that there's a little bit of it in, um, in what's it called before I leave. Uh, but it's something that I'm always kind of trying to approach. Um, and this is here. We're going to, I'm going to throw out something that I don't bring ever bring up on the, on the podcast, on the, on the main show, whether it be the live show or any other show, the first script I ever wrote, was a, a short film called The Septence. And it was basically about this man who was an alcoholic and depressed. And this other girl who was depressed as well and, anxious and has anxiety. And they are, are interviewed by the student who's creating an awareness program at a university. Not a good script at all. The dialogue was very, what's it called? Uh, it's, it's definitely my early work and you can tell, but that was, um, that was the first one. And that's where I really, what's it called? Went into my mental health in that, in that, in that one, I played the interviewer in, in that we shot once, no, two scenes. And I didn't go back to it anymore because I did not like what I, what I was making. And um, it's also, Odd when you cast one of your friends who's buff and he's supposed to be an alcoholic who's depressed. Let me tell, tell let me tell you, you did not look the part. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. Yeah, I also had another what's it called a script after that one called Mania, that was about a man who loses his um his brother, um and he becomes what's it called a uh, very depressed, and he loses himself. And he believes that he's now living in a world where his brother does exist and his girlfriend didn't, didn't break up with him. So it's a, it's a very interesting script as well. That one, I do need to go back and look into it and, you know, actually, you know, further develop it again was one that I was really interested in, 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 in actually what's it called? Uh, what's it called? Uh, filming. We were going to film it. Actors fell through. What, so, were, were there parallels of that script in your life? Um, well, you know, my mental health has been a part of me for a really long time. Um, like I always tell my friends, 
it's a rather interesting thing when you think about it, you know, you actually go and you seek your help, right. And they start talking to you about these things and your, your, um, your, your, what's it called your symptoms. And you start looking back and you're like, Oh, so that's why I was acting a specific way at age 14 or at age 13. I thought that it was just the hormones that come with being a teenager, but it was something more than that. Um, so I was, um, I, I want to say, you know, my first instance with it was around like age 13 or 14, 12, around there, you know, just the uh, getting these bouts of extreme forms of sadness. And, uh, and I was, I've always gotten panic attacks ever since I was in like, uh, fourth, third grade. I always had panic attacks when it was something like, you know, my homework being turned in late or not, you know, what's it called? Uh, my, my parent, my, what's it called? Uh, me acting up in class and me, you know, getting a call, they wanting to call my parents or something, you know, something just as simple as that. Like, you know, or like I was saying something and the teacher wanted me to, what's it called? Uh, speak louder because they didn't want to hear what I said. And I would just get a little bit anxious. So, uh, but you know, panic attacks really started, you know, more like around fourth and fifth grade and, uh, onto sixth, until middle school and high school and I started having them more and more and more. But, um, you know, the depressive side of me really started to kind of show itself around like age 13, 14, the, the uh, earliest I can remember. And when, when did you start seeking help for that? You're going to hate me for it, but, um, <clears throat> my freshman year of college, be, well, you, and, you, and to understand that you also have to understand the culture that I grew up in, you know, very much um the latino culture has a very big stigma against mental health you know only the crazy people seek the help nothing's wrong with you you're not crazy um even though my family has a uh, big hereditary lineage of mental health problems like if you look at it you, you know it's called i've talked about it you know border personality disorder bipolar disorder that's fine let's go depression uh what's it called uh ang a general anxiety disorder paranoia um, and, you know, it, it keeps on going and going and going. I mean, you know, but the, the culture I grew up in limited me from ever wanting to seek help. The one time I wanted to seek help, uh, my mother told me that I was not crazy to go to therapy. And, um, from there, you know, I never brought it up again until things started to get a lot harder and a lot difficult in my freshman year of, of college. And I got on medication and in, in, in December of 2015, and I've been on medication ever since December of 2015. And are you, is your family aware of that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. They're aware of it. Um, they're aware that it's kind of given me my life back. Um, even though I will say, I always say that, um, as long as I don't go back to the periods between 2015 and 2017, I, I think that I'm doing all right because those were really, really tough times. Um, you know, and they're really, really hard times that I look back at. And I say that I'm glad I got on medication at that point, because if I would have gotten, let's say medication on in 2018, I think things would have been a lot worse than you could imagine. I can understand that because I, I remember some definitely, yeah. definitely some things that came up in your life that w w we may talk about later, but mm -hmm. uh, I'll go, I'll go from that into um, being a little more uplifting in a way, somewhat. Um, I'm going to go into your family now. All right. Um, so I, I just want to go on the record and say, I watched like every film on your YouTube <laughs> when doing this, I literally did. Hey, you did your homework, bro. <laughs> I did my homework. So, yeah. and one of the the main film that really like I love love the outlaw, um, but the main film that I really saw like very intimate was Bloodline. Everybody always says that it, always it, it's the what? most. It, it is the most intimate film I think you've made. Yeah, and it's specifically about your family. Of course. Yeah, uh, but Bloodline's always like, you know, it's Bloodline. Bloodline's the one and I'm like, I, and, I, and it was interesting because we did a stream and we looked at, you know, we looked at before Beyond the River and we looked at Bloodline and we talked about the things that I wanted to do a little bit different or just really the production process throughout that. And I said, looking back at it now, 
I would have done a lot of stuff different with bloodline. I would have added a lot more scenes. I would have cut a little bit more freely. And I don't know. I, I mean, it beats me why you guys are the ones you, why you guys gravitate to uh bloodline the most. I believe that is also my most watched one. I believe it is too. And it's just, I, I think it's because you focus on your family and it, to me, it's the most intimate film you you've done yet. Um, this next one might, up in that for all I know, but for now to me, bloodline is, is definitely the inner kind of the more inner looking mm -hmm. aspect to it. Um, so the first act is called past and mm -hmm. it's an interview with your grandfather and his attitude and one that's hard work, perseverance, and that'll get you where you want to go in life. That's, that's basically about the quote. Um, and how he just, he, he got his slice of the American dream. Mm -hmm. And do you think this way of thinking of always give the best, always strive for the best has been passed down through your family? Very much. Um, uh, you know, so growing up with parents of who were father, da daughters and, and sons of immigrants, it was always passed on to us. Hey, the only thing we can give you guys that we can 100% give you, because even if even if food may not always be on the table, if may, if if clothes if the newest clothes won't ever be on your bodies, the only thing we can give you is an education. That's the first thing, and it's the one thing that we can give you, the public education. You know, the college we'll we'll see. You know, <laughs> but you know, public education we can give you that, and it was always that my mother viewed us as these warriors who didn't matter how hard things got in school. We were always giving our 100% at it. And because of that, we reaped our benefits from it. And we, we, we were, um, we got the grades that we, 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 um, the grades that we wanted because we tried really hard and we pushed ourselves to make sure that we got that. Of course, our, our mother had kids who were pretty much nerds you know we, we we loved we loved the history we loved science we loved uh math not really math never was a love of mine science chemistry and all that was really a big love of mine it influenced the way that i you know ended up what's it called a uh, majoring my first year of college but you know history english writing huge love i mean my big brother's a big fan of of uh, reading and and did did your mother treat basically all her sons the same in that aspect? Mm -hmm. okay. Every single one of their sons, her sons had to give it all in our education. Nobody else got a, oh, it's okay if you got a 70. No. So so Eric being the baby didn't affect no. that? Okay. No, at all. At all. Eric got the same treatment as all of us in that roof, roof got when it came to us trying at school, because Brad, you have to look at it at what, what it is to be, you know, you have these, 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 these people, you know, you have my mom, and my dad, my dad, an immigrant, my mom, let's go here. Who's a daughter of an immigrant who saw what her family had to go through. And she knew that the way to get to where she could be successful in this life had to be through an education. And, she had to make sure that we at least finished the bachelor's degree because that would be the way that we could at least live in this country comfortably. And that, at that point actually goes into my next question, mm -hmm. which is the second part of the film that's called present. present. And that's probably my favorite part of the film actually. And that that's the interview with your aunt Virginia de la Garza and just her recounting her childhood and just Picking, I believe it was cherries with her mother, mm -hmm. and she just did. just those experiences she had, and how she wanted her daughter to go to college so she wouldn't have to have those same kind mm -hmm. of hardworking experiences. Um, can you talk more on this emphasis within the Latino community of the pursuit of higher education, like college? Yep. Um, I mean, so that 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 is no. Um, that is no hyperbole, my friends. It was very normal for children 
if they could not go to school, that they had to work the fields with their um, with their with their parents. I mean, they picked cherries, they picked any what's it called sort of a vegetable fruit that could be picked off the ground. I mean, it happens now. I mean, you look at those tomatoes. Guess who picked those tomatoes? It's probably a Latino. And you know, if you they could not afford the school, if they could not afford to send their children to school, that's what they had to do. And uh, for some of them, they could even go to school, but they still had to do that work. Mm-hmm. So you know, that was very much what my what's it called? My my aunt had to do, and a lot of my aunts, you know, they were like, okay. Right. Especially in summers, you know, summers, you would think, oh, what's it called? Um, you know, it's summer vacation, we get to play outside, we get to stay in bed. Nope, nope, not for my family, not for a lot of the people in my culture either. Uh, summers were spent going to the um, to Michigan or California to pick cherries and pick fruits and vegetables because they had to get all the money they could to make sure that the next coming, uh, what's it called, uh, seasons, they would be able to pay for the things they needed to pay for. Uh, so it was in, in a sense, my family were kind of migrant workers, even though they always had their, you know, their home here, mm-hmm. but they were going, yeah, they were going to different places, they were going to work. California and uh, in Michigan to pick the, the fruits and that 100% influenced the way that we had to view education because they were like, if you don't go to school, this is what you're going to do. And, and I, I think uh, a lot of parents, and especially the Latino community, but like at least with my family, it was kind of the same way of if you don't want an education, you're going straight to military. Yep. So it, it was there wasn't any of this non-working in between time. This was, you know, either you take your education seriously and you do better than we did, or we're going to find a different path for you to do better than we did. Yeah. And uh, that's what my father brought me up on. Uh, my father works in the, um, in the oil industry with a beating son on his back and um, what's it called wearing the most hottest clothes you can possibly think of. And he said, if you don't go to school, if you don't look, go to college, if you don't get your degree, this is what you're going to work. In. And if I see you working in here, I'll kill you. Metaphorically, but I'm pretty metaphorically, sure. but, metaphorically may, but maybe would, not. <laughs> let's be real. What he would probably do is influence the what's it called the, the boss to fire me, and so that I could you know, go finish school. But you know, yeah. metaphor, but then again, I'm pretty sure he whooped my ass. But you know, he said if you if I see you here, I better not see you here. I, and like I, we have like we have the same father. Um. Yeah, um, <laughs> I I always think that you know I could do a lot of things to disappoint my father, but I think that doing what he works, I think that would be the biggest disappointment I could ever give him. Because he wants better for you. He wants better for me. Um, and from that, we'll go to the third and final act of Bloodlines, and that's Future. Of course, this is an interview with with Baby Eric. I like to call it Baby Eric because he, <laughs> he just looks like a little little child. Um, that's that that's the one. So that I always show him, and he's always like, "I don't have a lisp. I don't have a lisp." I'm like, "Watch Bloodline. You have a lisp." Come on, come on, Eric. You have you have a slight lisp. Yeah. It, it's nothing bad. It's, yeah. it's nothing what you have. It. Ain't nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Um, and a main part of his interview, most of it, is the discussion of motivation. So, yeah. Roel, what motivates you? My culture, um, my family, um, the fact that if things didn't go if I didn't seek the help I got in 2015 possibly would not be talking to you right now because I'd be probably be buried six feet in the ground. Um, so a lot of things, man. Also just, um, my brother who is, uh, legally blind and he's still able to do all the things he does at, at this time. You know, he's able to, you know, walk from, you know, go on a bus ride to go to his class and to school, I mean, that's school to work. And, you know, he's able to, you know, live the life that he has and he's able to work. How, how much, how much older is Fernie than you? Nine years older. Nine years older. Yes. So, so you, you had a lot of time with him at nine years old. I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I had time. I mean, I grew up in a household where his accomplishments were always talked about. What's it called? He was valedictorian of high school. 
He graduated with honors in, in his bachelor's degree. He got his master's degree. You know, I lived in a household that always talked about his, uh, his accomplishments. And even though at times it was things that were annoying me because it always felt like as if my parents expected me to do the things that he did. Uh, but once I got older, I realized that it was more for motivational reasons mm. to show that, you know, your brother has so many limitations and, um, and he was still, still able to accomplish so much to accomplish the things like, and he's still accomplishing things. I mean, yeah, uh, he's definitely read far more books than I ever have. So he's producing, <laughs> he's producing before I leave with us. Um, he's what's it called? Um, he produced beyond the river. Um, he helped, you know, what's it called? Uh, look at the, look at the scripts and everything. He did the same thing with before I leave. He looked at the scripts. He basically, what's it called? Consulted us with that. So, uh, I remember when I started Cyclops Films and I told him that I wanted to do this and he's like, okay, cool. He ended up buying like three books on script writing and really he was like, he kind of got himself in there and he's like, okay, cool. This is what we're going to do. So, um, you know, my brother is very motivating because when he really wants to do something, if he's really into it, he really goes into it. And if you, you know, have him, if you, if you, if you know him personally, you know that he reads a shit ton of books and he does like a whole year challenge where he reads like many books from a specific theme. It's kind of what I try to do with my movie challenge, but uh, 2020 had other things in plan. I mean, we, we've still watched a, quite a few of those movies. I watched like um, almost 20, almost 20. Yeah, no. Not the full 75, but we, uh, we got 75 is asking a lot. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Um, but kind of continuing on that uh, with the family theme, how supportive is your family regarding your pursuit of a film career? Um. A lot. Well, uh, that's a really good question. Um, my mom's pretty supportive. Uh, I like I said, I, I I bring this up on a lot of uh, episodes when I do interviews about you know, been going around several episodes uh, shows to kind of talk about before I leave. And I think the thing is, they've always been supportive. They just needed to see that this was something I take seriously, right? You know, it isn't like, oh, I'm into it. Because a lot of people will say they're a filmmaker, but they don't have anything under their belt. You know, yeah. they don't actually do anything. They don't actually write or they just yeah, say you know, they're a filmmaker. So, and I think even to, even now with this year, after seeing the massive su success of the crowdfund. I think they really do realize that I'm kind of headed to something that I might be able to make into a career. So, so have they, has the crowdfunding really kind of changed their perspective mm -hmm. of it? Mm -hmm. Kind of. I think, I think a, a lot because I just, the attitude when I tell them like, Hey, I just got another donation. They're like, what? That's crazy. Or when I talk to them about this and they're like, how much listens do you have? Like 58,000 something. And they're like, that's wild. That's awesome. That's great. You know, I'm, I think now they're kind of understanding it a little bit more. I, I don't kind, of, kind of that entertain the, the entertainment mm -hmm. business in a way is still a business. It's not just a hobby or a dream of yours. Yeah. And, and I can't say I was never, they were never supportive because I don't think so. I think they just um, were scared that this was something that I probably wasn't into or that I was just going to fuck up with it. But I think going forward, I think things like me releasing my first one, you know, Immortal, nobody saw Immortal. Let's be real here. Nobody saw Immortal. Immortal was something pretty. Um, boy, you Brad, you watch. <laughs> nobody, nobody talks about Immortal. Even, even though if you look at all the films I've done, the short films I got. Immortal is probably one of the more um, interesting ones. And it's, well, it, it's the trees talking. Yeah. And it's also one of the more, um, what's the word I'm trying to get at? Um, um, not, not artistic. I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to say that it was the one that, you know, it was kind of a gamble to start that off. Like with that one, I was like, I could have made some like, two page script and I film extra stuff that aren't in there. But instead I went with a project for my class and we did something pretty and Oh, ambitious. Yeah. It was probably one of the more ambitious works that I've done. And I haven't gone back to that. Mm -hmm. It was highly experimental. So, you know, you saw that, but then it was until bloodline when they saw everything that I was doing. And, you know, I was seeing my mom looking at me when I was, when I'm doing the interview of my aunt and just like, okay, 
This guy raised up all this. This guy saved all this money. I saved up the whole summer I worked during my my that semester, and I spent all the money. And I think I left like three hundred in my bank account to buy a camera because I knew that this was something I wanted to do. And th- this was for the filming of Bloodlines. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which which I will say that was a good purchase because that opening shot with the field that always gets me. Just still how beautiful that shot is. Still one of my favorites. I still don't know how I got that. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I saved up money. I got a camera. And at first, well, I was like, okay, this is, I'm putting this camera to my career. But also, like, I was making YouTube videos and stuff. And obviously, nobody watched that crap. You know, nobody watched it. And that's why I also deleted it because I didn't like those videos anymore. But, you know, you saw that I was actually doing these things. And I was actually going forward with it. And I was doing more and more with it. And I think now where we're looking at it right now with the crowdfund. I think that definitely they're like, okay, it looks like he's got something here. Now, now people may not, and I know Stacy joked this, the role of cinematic universe, but, <laughs> but if you don't know this, the, there's a scene in search of the outlaw where you're standing in front of the same field as bloodlines. So mm-hmm. it is the role of cinematic universe in a way it's taking place in the same area. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, kind of, yeah, yeah. I, I, just, I just wanted to bring that up because Stacy made that joke and I just thought of that right now. Yeah. Um, and this, other than the mental health question, this is probably going to be the toughest question I think I'm going to give to you just to let you know. So I personally know being both a friend and also a partner on the podcast network with you. Um, how this event affected you. But can you explain to everyone listening how the loss of your grandmother affected you and how it affected your family? Yeah. Um, So I always say it. I never taken days off on this podcast, like consecutive. There might be one episode where I'm like, hey, man, I'm just not feeling it today and it's hard for me to get to do this. But um, I did have to take days off because of that. I think it was a total of three or four, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, I think we were off for about a week. Yeah. I was I I, I took it off. Um happily, Ashley and yourself, you know, took over for a bit and you had to do everything you had to do with it. And I was like, oh thank, thank. Ashley had no idea who Hitchcock and Truffaut were. And she still did that 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 Patreon. She's still amazing. Like I said, Ashley is the natural podcaster. And I wish, mm-hmm. uh, and I can't wait till she gets back to it she after the pandemic and everything. Not even knowing who they were, and still talked about that film. Yeah. Um. By the way, which we probably need to at one time go back to me and you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to get the book. I really want to get the book because, you know, there's just so much with that interview. But um, my my grandmother, my grandmother raised us. Um, So my mom would leave, mom would take us to school. The bus would come back, come to drop us up after school. And we would um, go with her to uh, eat and wait for her, my mom to get back. So if you look at it, like around like mm, seven hours of spending school, right? Uh, I want to say like two hours that we spent um, at at the house to get ready to go back to go to school, and then we she comes back by like around five something, so from like five to uh, like six to like let's say six to ten, where were my mom? Most of that time is spent with my grandma. Um, my grandma, hold on, man. I'm, I'm tearing up a little bit. No, nah, take yeah. as much time yeah. as you need. I knew th- this is, like I said, this was going to be the probably the hardest that, question. That, that's a wound that will always be open. And uh, yeah, I'll talk about Lulu Wong's The Farewell about that. But, you know, um, my grandma raised us. She really did. Um, <laughs> you know, when we went to, um, to McDonald's, eat burgers with her, you know, stuff like that, man. And, uh, By the way, I'm not baking this, guys. Uh, I actually am tearing up. Um, we lost a very important person in our family. I mean, the glue that held together our family, but also somebody who was so important to us. So she she was definitely the patriarch yeah. of the she family. Was the matriarch, the matriarch of the family. Matriarch, sorry, one thousand percent. Um, she was the matriarch. 
and having to see her deteriorate with her um, with her Alzheimer's and dementia was probably one of the hardest things I saw growing up. Yeah. And uh, it was really hard. Did, did she ever get a chance to see one of your films? Nope. Nope. She never did. She saw me graduate high school. She'll never get to see me graduate college, but she saw me graduate high school. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll move on for this. That was going to, I knew that was going to be the toughest question, yeah. but I, I would be remiss as an interviewer and a friend to not mention your grandmother who we know yeah. was so important to you. Came at the best time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I dedicated Beyond the River to my grandmother. Um, I talk about the idea of Beyond the River being about this film where you're separated between worlds. And uh, I don't know where my grandmother is. I, I'm not a believer of the afterlife. But wherever she is, I dedicated that film to her. All right. I'll, I'll give you a second if you need it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for answering that role. I knew that was going to be a tough one. I know. I know. I know. Um, nah, I'm getting a little teared up. <laughs> getting in those feels. Yeah, a little bit. I'm just something insane. lighter. <laughs> um, something lighter. So, so that was, that was my, my family category. If you couldn't yeah. tell. Um, so we'll move on to the film categories. How much work? Did I put in a lot of time on this. Um, <laughs> um, so continuing with film and specifically those you have directed bloodline killing you beyond the river in search of the outlaw. Tell us some of the most difficult experience you have had as a director and what are some of the most satisfying oh. experiences you've had? Oh God. Um, We'll start with the one that I always go to, right? Um, I'm shooting the second to last scene for Beyond the River. Um, was, it, was this in the bar? It's supposed to be a specific pan and my tripod is feeling like it's giving me force. I'm rubbing it off. I'm saying this is specifically a pretty... um. A pretty what's it called? Um old tripod. I I I I know that it's 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 on its way out. So um, you know, I'm not really gonna, you know, you know, what's it called? Um give it any thought. It, there's no way that it can pop off. I'm panning. I'm panning. Boom. Let's just say I had a reflex that I didn't think I had. We went boom and I went. Grab the camera. <laughs> that, that that tripod's inside my uh, my closet right now. It's it's standing in a little corner where it deserves to be. It's nowhere. It's never touching another one of my cameras ever again. Did, did you have to buy a new tripod? Yes, but I was overdue a good tripod. You okay. know, that was the tripod that was given to me. I mean, that my uh, uh, my aunt bought that for a dollar at a garage sale. But let's just say, I saw a fly flash before my eyes. It's a good thing I had a reflex that I had because if I didn't catch my camera and if I would have let the damn, the, 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 the pan, the pan, the, the, what's it called? The handle go, I'm out of a camera and I would not yeah. be able to make the money to, to go to school, to live in Houston and go to school in there while having a camera. And like you said before, you saved up all summer for that camera. Yeah. How much did that camera specifically cost? You have the Peter Tingle, <laughs> um, $848. It well, it came with the camera body, a 18 to 35, 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens, which is a piece of shit. Um, a 32 gigabyte, uh, what's it called? A SD card that I don't have anymore because my radio station kept it and they lost it. And a Rode video mic go, which is a piece of shit. But you know, with my experience with audio, I was able to use that piece of shit audio and make something out of it. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, um, uh, let's just say 848 to raise again while having to live in, in another city with 
even though I had a meal plan, I had a place to stay and stuff. Still, three hundred dollars. It would, wouldn't have been food. possible. Mm-mm, mm-mm. And um, I under another one. I always say this. It was until right now, before I leave, will be the first film I make with an actual crew. Wait, that, so, so the previous films you've done has just been you behind the camera. That's it. Mm-hmm. Beyond the River was supposed to be the first one I did with the crew, and everybody kind of dropped out. And um, I, and of course, you know, I, I had two films that I was supposed to do in, um, in what's it called? Um, in my last semester, didn't happen because of the pandemic. I have a documentary that I shot with the crew, but I don't have the video file for that. And I don't think I'm going to get the video file. The guy and I haven't talked in a long time, and I'm not going to get my file. And I want it for my reel because I did a really good job as a DP. Mm-hmm. There, there's a real, but um, before I leave will be the first film I ever do with a crew. And uh, I mean, but you know, had that camera dropped, and because this was when we were doing the podcast, we've <laughs> I, I've seen you been very good at crowdfunding when it came to the broken computer and to now a whole film. Yeah. So I have no doubts you probably could have raised with the help of Nikki and the rest. I think that it would have been at least another year or a half until we actually got a new camera. But, you know, um, I'm glad that I caught it. Um, it's, it's, it's fell or before, after, uh, two more times, um, uh, fell when I was doing the shoot for the outlaw. Um, but it fell on the grass and it didn't do anything to it. Okay. Fell at the beach for another project I was doing for class because the wind was really strong. Uh, only thing that fucked up is a little button in the back that I actually have to dig my nails in to pull out when I plug it in. But the good thing is that button doesn't really do much. Okay. But working with no crew is probably one of the hardest things you have to do in a, in a, um, in a work that is very team based. Um, me having to be my own DP, my camera op, um, my, my um my director my uh, script supervisor my everything we having to be everything is probably one of the hardest things and i refuse to go back to that unless it's something as easy as you know uh, not as easy but as uh not constraining as in search of the outlaw like i could do i did that one on my own i could do that one on my own yeah but something like before i leave beyond the river i couldn't do those beyond my own and i think that it reflected on how i did with beyond the river because i didn't have a crew so would you say that's your most satisfying experiences are the ones that you were able to do on your own and came out well or. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and also um, one that I will um, talk about that I didn't, what's it called? Uh, I don't think I really talk about much. Um, One of my most satisfying experiences is the amount of people that I meet that are really into what I do in our, in our, in our, what's it called? Are willing to help me out with it. Um, In that second to last scene uh, beyond the river, uh, we needed extras. And when I got there, I completely forgot that we needed extras. I see these two people sitting down on a uh, table. Uh, they're on their Mac. They're on their computer. They're drinking coffee and tea. And I just go up to them like, Hey, uh, this is who I am. And it was, I'm a filmmaker. I'm making a film and this is our story. I need two extras. All you need to do is to get up. You say, Hey, I haven't seen you in a long time and that's it. And you just sit back down. So that's all you got to do. And they were supposed to leave. And they said, yes, we ended up doing two takes, three takes of that. I sent them off on their own and I have not heard from them since, but that was one of my most satisfying is the fact that I got somebody to help me out. One of my most, the most satisfying, the most satisfying right now, definitely raising $4,000 for this film. For this, uh, I think you mean more, but you know, yeah. <laughs> and some change, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you for those experiences. Um, so continuing the film category for a lot of directors, the Coen brothers, Akira Kurosawa, Andre Tarkovsky, nature is such a major focus in their films. Having watched your films, I also see this focus be it the park and beyond the river, the trees and immortal, the films and bloodline, and even in water and calm feelings, which you edited. Yeah. What does nature mean to you? And was its importance in your opinion in film? Um, that's so interesting. 
Um, because, and I'm glad that you brought it up because I would not, what's it called? Um, I didn't think somebody paid attention that much to what I do here. Um, nature, if we look at the teachings of, uh, Jean, Jean what's it called? Jean Pierre, Jean Pierre Rousseau, Rousseau, the uh, philosopher Rousseau, uh, nature is the original land of man. That is where man is completely, uh, uncorrupted by the world. And is what's it called? Um, and it is where man is pure. There is nothing to influence man in, in nature. It's just him and his most natural state. Um, and it also uh, nature when it came to you know <clears throat> indigenous populations. Nature was a very big thing as well. So you know to me. Nature is very important. It's very much the um, idea of where we came from and where, you know, where we seem to be the most free. Even though I will be honest, I, I sent you the link, by the way, for, for another reason. Okay. Um, but for me, what's it called? Even though I can't stand one, five minutes in the damn southern sun, the sun in the south is terrible. I hate that. But the feeling of being outside and being surrounded by vegetation, by being surrounded by the natural state of our world is very, um, very calming. It's very beautiful. Well, it, it just, calming. just the, the film directors that we just cherish many of their films, they involve nature. Curacao is my favorite in that the natural lighting and just those shots of the light coming through the leaves of trees I mean, it, it, to me, it doesn't get much better. Yeah. Oh, so you don't really have to direct. You don't. You don't have to direct nature. You know, you don't have to tell them how to stand. You don't have to tell them how to rustle. You can point the camera for an hour straight, and you can point a camera for a duration of your battery and your duration of your SD card. Somewhere in there, you'll have enough that you see some true beauty and you don't have to really what's it called uh create that beauty it's 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 there it's been there since the creation of this planet i, I do gotta say i think tarkovsky probably did command nature in some of those <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure yeah I mean, called, um, for watering calm feelings like even though i edited that but i wanted to concentrate on that calming feeling of water and how beautiful it is and how reflective it is but how how soothing it can be. Just look at it and at it. And you're like, wow. It's so oh no, you, you totally hit that in that. So mm -hmm. I, I commend that one. Um, so last question in the film category in search of the outlaw. That's probably my favorite from you so far. Yeah. So you got, you got one coming up to, I mean, I've said this before. I absolutely just love the shots in that just yeah. the silent movie film of it. the, Luis just smoking a cigarette. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like you, you got man candy on there. So yeah, um, pretty good job with it. Right? Yeah, he 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 definitely plays the part of a gunslinger. Yeah. And my question being, will you expand this short film? And if so, can you give us some ideas you've had that you may make it into a future script slash film? Um, possibly. Yeah. Uh, some, what's it called a. Be honest with you, Alex reached out to me and he was like, I really like this. I think we can expand on this. Um, Alex, who is Alex Flores, who is my producing and writing partner. Uh, he's also the guy that edits a lot of my stuff. He edited Beyond the River. Uh, he's editing before I leave. And uh, he's doing most of the other projects that I do, except for the ones I do for class. But um, yeah, he's like, hey, we can expand on this. Um, ideally, spoiler warning for those of y'all, if I ever do make a, a continuation of it and I expand it, I wanted to show that um, the out, the outlaw brought in more people with him, and Luis has to run, and he mm. has to go back, and he has to kind of round up what's it called a, a what's it called a, a gunslingers of his own, so that way they could help take on the outlaws. So a Seven Samurai esque. Seven Samurai, hey. but really, you know, the idea of being the lone gunslinger and having to get along with a team of rebels and. Yeah, so I wanted, I, I wanted, I want to, but it's also I've got a lot of ideas in my head and really in script form uh, that I could, I would really like to, you know, kind of work on. But 
I wouldn't say I'm not into the idea of possibly, um, you know, expanding that. I think that it's something that a lot of people really gravitated towards. They actually enjoyed a lot of it. So I was like, hmm, we'll see what we can do. All right. Cool. That makes that makes my heart happy. Yeah. Um, you were a big fan of the steadiness of those shots, bro. Yeah, I really was. Like, because if you look at your previous films, you, you don't have quite that steadiness. Um and like beyond the river, you would have, and this is something I kind of like in some of your films is how it would go out of focus and then come back in. Like in the bar scene, you had a lot of shots that would go out of focus, come back in. I enjoyed that. I don't know if that was meant, but I enjoyed that. It's not meant, but it's very much taken from my love of uh, of uh, French cinema especially the uh, director, Agnes Varda, I always kind of want to give a documentarian feel to the films. I think that a lot of the films that I make are things that we experience in real life. So if you look at it through the eyes of being of a documentary, I think it's interesting. I wouldn't say outright that all my narrative work are documentaries because they're not. But if I can bring that feeling where I'm literally taking the viewer into where I'm at, I think that it, provides a really interesting scope very cool yeah um all right now gone through the film so let, let's get to the one of the main reasons we're here that's before i leave yeah duh uh, so <coughs> why did you go the crowdfunding route and did you expect this much support when you started the campaign hell no hell no um, but I should have known better. You see the support we have on our Patreon. I should have known better. I should have known that people were going to come out for this. Um, I, and even people like Nikki, who wasn't able to don't, who isn't able to donate, but she shared it and shared it and shared it. You know, I should have known that people were going to come out for this. And I really, I don't think people will understand how much that helps in just sharing it. Like if you can't do anything else, even just telling your friends who tell their friends and it, it just, it's a snowball effect. That's really what it is. It gets to the people who, you know, want to either share it or contribute. And all it takes is that one person just to send it out there into the world. Yeah. And I wanted to go with the crowdfunding because of course I've seen Jason Inman and Ashley V. Robinson, people who have come on the show before who I would like to say that they are friends, um, who I would like to think that they're our friends. You know, they were able to do their comics because of crowdfunding. Um, I could, you know, my professor was like, you could, you, my professor said, who was going to do this independence, who is sponsoring the independent study. We're doing it. He was like, okay, we can do the pre-production. And we can somehow take this to be able to get a grant so you can actually get a budget to make this. And I outright said, no, ma'am, I'm thinking about doing a crowdfund. Um, I want to make this right now. Um, if, it, if it's not right now, I can't, I'm not going to be able to do this. I, I, I have to do it right now. Um, obviously, I'm doing something smart as well. Is I'm, I'm filming the scenes with the least amount of people right now. Yeah. Next, this month. And then in spring... We'll come back for the scene with a bunch of people. But I I I I say it every single time we're on the live show when I do and I say it every single time we're on the main show. This network is created by people and it's for people. Um all I All people. Yeah, all people. Let's go. You look at our Instagram bio. The Nerdcore is a di is what's it called? Is a podcast network made of diverse people and minds that present views on 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 and on the entertainment industry. I care about people more than company. Um, that's not to say that I wouldn't like to be sponsored by companies. I would like to, but when I'm sponsored by people and when people back me, I have a creative freedom to that. And those people can outright tell me they believe in my creative vision and they believe in the project. I've gotten a lot of people who are like, when I tell them, thank you so much for donating. I don't know why you would donate, but you, and what's the one thing they say? I believe in your project. I believe in the vision you have for this project. I wanted to go with the crowdfunding because I knew that it would take months for me to find a company that could give me the money to make this. But I never believed that I was going to take days to find people who wanted to back this. So it, to me, it feels a, 
a more satisfactory to know that this project is backed by people and not mm -hmm. a corporate entity who who you know they have a they have a hand in the cookie jar in a way mm -hmm. and they could try and bend you to what they want to do yeah so that that's got to be a good feeling of that freedom which you know we we've, we've always said with this podcast it's it's our baby i mean and we're not owned by anyone so we can literally say whatever we want yeah I, I don't want anybody to limit what we can say. I don't want people to change the things that we want to do because that's when we're being dishonest and we're going against the very fabric of why we made this because I saw there was not a lot of people, there was not a lot of Latinos who were making podcasts. There was not a lot of, you know, black folk who were on podcasts. I said, Hey, I'm going to make a network. I'm going to do me and Luis first. And then if I can bring a bunch of people on of different creeds and colors and, and, and sexual orientations and religions, I can do that and I can bring it and I can and and just different genders and the, what's it called? Uh, sexualities. I can bring them in here and I can give them a spot because not a lot of people are given the spot. And, well, like and, said, and it's amazing how just being <laughs> open and honest about that and being welcoming, having a welcoming nature for this podcast that we do, you do get those people. You get those people come in to interact, to chat of all kinds of walk of life, just because we're so open to them. Yeah. One, one, one thing is saying, one thing is screaming on the internet and screaming on your podcast that you want to see the change in this world that you want. And one thing is just doing it, you know, and actually giving a spot to people who need a spot, you know, us doing something with the platform that we have. And that's what I like, like I've said, that that's the big reason why I'm, you know, chasing a, a career in this industry, a career where my people aren't really that represented and we're not really behind the camera all that much. You know, we have some great, you know, what's it called? Uh, people who made it and, you know, some of the greatest filmmakers of all time, Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu, Guillermo del Toro, Alfonso Cuaron, you know, they, they've led this path for us to get in here, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And I always said was, I'm tired of asking for this representation. I want to be the one who can do it. I want to make it. At some point, we have to stop asking and we have to start doing. And that is probably the most difficult thing is just to start, which <clears throat> that that's, and I'll just go back to the podcast. That's what this was built on was we had a crappy system to begin with. I was on a laptop at the time. <laughs> And it was those episodes, they're terrible, but they are what started this and they were kind of foundational and how we built up from there. And I think that's what a lot of people need is they need to hear just start. Mm -hmm. If it's bad, it's bad, but you're starting and you'll get better. It and and I, I hope I hope we've gotten better through the years. Yeah. I mean, remember, remember the 90 minute, the 90 minute limit that Anchor gave us? Yeah, I do. There was a lot of stuff that we had to cut out. Well, the only time I ever cut out stuff out of a podcast was because we went for almost like um, an hour and 45 or an hour and uh, 50 something, almost two hours. We were talking about so much news. We had to cut all that out. And I still put it up. You know, our crappiest episodes, the when we weren't feeling that good and we weren't really on our A game, still put, still them, put up. them up. I mean, because, you know, out of the out of the few bad episodes we have, I feel like most of the, most of the episodes we make, they're they're pretty good. Yeah, they're pretty good to listen to based on what we are able to do at this point in time. Because we're we're steadily creating a documentary of our progress. We're showing you all where we came from, and and if I only care if I cared only about the good stuff where you can hear the nice quality of our voices, then honestly, we'd be at like two hundred episodes right now. Because we would have to edit everything. Yeah, edit everything. Yeah. So, like, if I cared so much about that, then we, I'd still be at the planning phases of this, and I'd be still worried about what microphone I need to spend money on and what everything I need to make sure that I have. And, you know, it's just starting it, really. It's just starting it. As long as you have that idea and you know what you want to do, just start it. Stop, stop thinking about whether you have the right gear for it, whether you have the right voice for it. That's the one complaint I hear most of it. It's like, oh, my voice doesn't fit this. My voice doesn't sound good. You hear my voice? 
I never wanted to put my voice out there, but I got people who are like, yo, Raul, you have a really good voice. You do for, for, yeah. uh, for a podcaster. Yeah, and um, and I, I, I honestly never wanted to put my face out there. And mm -hmm. yeah, here we are. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I do it for you all, but if I, if I could, I would not show my face, but I do it for you all. But yeah. Like, hey, you have a good voice. It's what led me to want to get a radio, uh, be a radio host. I was a radio host for a year. And I did it. And I liked it. I'd love to work at another radio station, but under a different management. But, um, you know. I'm going to that. I still did it. I still did it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they listen to this, so you might want to calm the question down. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, this is raw, bro. <laughs> yeah, that's raw. Bro. Yeah, what yeah. are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, um okay so that, 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 that's pretty good I, I like that i like those answers um so beyond the river and before i leave both deal with the idea of love one being the fear of losing it and the other with the fear of confronting it in a way mm -hmm. do these ideas of love parallel your own lives um like I like oh, what's it called? I I was. This reminds me of a, a story. But we were I was outside of my documentary filmmaking class. I'm with a very good friend of mine who I very much miss and I really want to work again with. And then she asked like, "What what films are you kind of interested in doing?" Um, and I was like, "A lot of my films seem to under seem to what's it called um, revolve around the idea of love, but I don't want this, you know." Um, you know, rom-com bullshit. I don't want this beautiful. It's even, even if you got direct Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I don't want this, you know, like it's always beautiful. Nothing's ever wrong. Bullshit. I think that that's so fake. Love hurts. I fucking hurt. Sometimes you have fights that you don't want to have. There's some times that it doesn't work out. And uh, there's some times that you lose that love. And, and there's some times where you can't, actually show that love because of what people might think and what people are going to say. But, um, it doesn't really parallel parallel my life because what's it called? I am very much, I, I, I said it before, I'll say it again. I've, 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 I've talked about it on the podcast many times. Uh, I've never had a girlfriend. Um, I've never had sex. I've never done a lot of things in my life. Um, but I am, I, I analyze a lot. I analyze people a lot. I think about people and what makes us us. And I think one of the most natural feelings we can have in our body is to love one another and not even in a relationship form, in a friendship form, you know, in, a, in, a, in, in as a brother and a sister, as a brother and, and brothers and sisters, you know, the most natural feeling we could have is love. Good answer. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> now, is there, is there, a film in particular, because you are like the cinematic like expert in a lot of things to me. Is there a film in particular that best shows love, in your opinion? Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Why is that? It shows that um, that that you know it, it love hurts. First of all, love hurts when when you lose it and when it's not with you anymore. It hurts. Like a motherfucker, to the point where you just want to forget that person altogether because of an impulsive decision. But also, spoiler warning for the film, you always end up coming back to the person. And I think that that's one of the most accurate depictions of it. It's not this beautiful thing that you look at and that is it's that is always good and always good. Sometimes there's bad things, and I think you can admit that as a married man, you know, sometimes it's not easy being married. You know, sometimes it, it, it's one of the most difficult things, I think, to honestly, because you can't run away when you're married. You can't just be like, I'm done. You 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 live in the same house. You have to confront issues. But yeah, and even then, you know, you genuinely love your wife. You love her more than anyone in this world. She's the love of your life. You know, you just can't walk out. You can't. And she I think ta she, she take the dogs. She take the dogs. And um, 
what's it called? Um, and I and I'm telling you, Eternal Sunshine as well as mine is very much that. Clementine does have another partner, but she doesn't feel for that partner the way that she feels for Joel. And Joel and, and, goes to and, anybody else. And you you realize what a mistake it was when he just erased her completely in mm -hmm. that film. That that film is just so just so it just hurts. It just <laughs> hurts. just up in your throat. That one is her. Her oh god, her hurts like a motherfucker. <laughs> But it's and good. It, it's it, it's good, and that's one thing I've learned from Raul is that, you know, some of these films they don't have to always have a happy ending. No, no. Taste of Cherry sure as hell didn't have a happy ending. But yeah. No, but that is up there is one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Next question. You make this quote in the Indiegogo campaign for Before I Leave of. I, I even watched the Indiegogo Go campaign video again, even though I've heard it in the start of every podcast. <laughs> I'm telling you, I will plug as hard as I can to make this happen. And we made it happen. So indeed it worked. And I stuck to my promise. I said, once we got fully funded, I would stop playing the video. And guess what? We got fully funded. Anyway, there's a quote in there and you have sexual identity and being a Latina. Mm hmm. Why did you want to explore this idea and what are you hoping to convey to the audience? I want to explore because it's a very big thing about our, about our culture. Um, you know, anybody who knows our culture, anybody, I mean, everybody who knows the society we live in, that's very homophobic, but our culture uh, because of our Catholic roots and, you know, it's, it's very much uh, something that you don't, you do not talk about. If you're gay, you don't talk about it. You don't bring it up ever. You know, your mom, your grandma can think, oh, man, her roommate keeps coming. Or his roommate is always coming to these damn parties. Like, you know, when, uh, when is when is Juanita ever going to get a real man? You know? Yeah. Well, damn it, grandma. It's the room. The, the, you don't need a man because you've been bringing the roommate these whole years. That's 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 her this is supposed to be a funny podcast role, but that's no, it's not supposed to. Be. <laughs> it's true. It'd be like it's true. Oh, she's always bringing her friend. That's her little friend, you know. Fuck, that ain't her little friend, bro. Her fucking partner. It's your partner. Um, <laughs> and um, it's something that you know that you know you're not supposed to talk about. You're not supposed to be about it because you know it's 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 seen as an abomination. It's seen as something unnatural. When I always say, you look at our indigenous roots um, and our in the indigenous populations, there was more than two genders in these indigenous populations. There was you know male, female, two spirit. You know, the whole idea of women warriors was because of them having multiple genders, you know, it's so I, I, I was I was I'm always been so interested in sexual identity and the way that we develop it in the way that we that we um that that we um not act on it the way that we um we um what's what's the word I'm trying to get here? The way that we show it. You know, the way they would mm -hmm. approach it. And that's always been so interesting to me because, of course, uh, you and I, you know, some of our best friends are gay. And, um, you know, let's go, Ash Ashley. Ashley's gay. She has a wife, you know. And when she told me about, you know, how it was growing up and having to talk about that and her being gay, you know, for a while they were like, oh, it's a phase, it's a phase, it's a phase. It's not a fucking phase. It's who, it's I, I, who she is. It's who she is. She has a loving wife. She has a great wife. And, you know, the other person wants to go, Alex, you know, fuck Alex ain't got a girlfriend or anything, but, you know, hey, Alex is living it up in here. But still, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was something hard for her to, you know, to, to uh, talk about with her, with her family. So I wanted to, re to see the way that we approach sexuality, but the way that we approach sexuality in a culture that is very, very concentrated on the family dynamic. Now, now, do you think that's more of the older generation who's still holding on to those old kind of ideas? Do you think the younger generation coming up is more open? Yeah. Well, if I talk to my cousins, they're like, you know, yeah, because my friend's gay. All right. I'm still my friend. But like, <clears throat> yeah, it's very much an older generation thing. I think that we're 
because we started to revolutionize inside the culture and we're starting to, you know, finally realize that a lot of the things that, that are wrong with our culture is because of colonialism. And we're starting to dismantle that. And we're starting to, we're starting this long process of decolonialism, decolonialism. And I think that with every generation that's coming, we're becoming more open-minded. Um, of course, there's a lot of us, a lot of it in the generation who are still holding on to what their mom and pop, mom and pop, you know, taught them and what grandma taught them. Yeah. I think we saw that in the recent vote. Yeah. Yeah. But a fraction of our culture is coming up with these ideas that, you know, let's go. It's okay to be who you are. And so you've always been, and that's what's important. And I'm trying to convey what I'm trying to convey with this film is that it's not something easy because I, I feel like as straight people we're like, what the fuck, man? Just tell them you're gay. It's not easy. It's not easy. Especially if you don't know how their parents are. Yeah. And it's it's and that's what I'm trying to convey. It's that it's a thing that has you have to think about really hard. Cause it could change everything. And there is a lot of people that we know that had the courage to say, well, fuck what did my family thinks. But there are some people that live in a culture where family is everything and they have to they have to really really understand what will happen with a situation like this. So I'm trying to convey that it's not an easy decision to make, but I'm also trying to convey that it's the right decision to make because it's who you've always been. It's who you've always been. It's 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 a natural feeling to love a person that you love. Mm-hmm. It's and it's, it's it's not something unnatural. It's something beautiful. It's something that you should be proud of. Well, and also that your family should support you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, should being the key word. Should is the key word, right? Yeah. Um, special guest who I had planned is coming in in ten minutes. By the way. Okay. Yeah. So but, so when when she comes in, I'll, she'll. I'll, I'll She'll have her have her questions ready, and yeah. uh, if I haven't gone through mine yet, then yeah. we we can always hit on that. But I I, I really want to talk about this person, who is a big part of the reason I'm standing here right now. I show my whole life with my sexuality, so it's very hard. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and I'm telling you that we learn every single day more about ourselves. You know, it's like distilling water. Slowly as time goes, certain bad stuff gets left behind on the best. Yeah. And we have to think about it as what's it called for the better of our culture and for the better of our people that we have to move on and we have to leave behind the things that are toxic about who we are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's the whole reason I make this film was because it was something very interesting to me in the way that we develop who we are and it, and it 100% becomes part of our identity. Well, and and the main thing I think is, you know, people get stuck with, well, change is bad. Change isn't always bad. No. Sometimes you need change. Yeah. For sure. 1,000%. Um, all right. So last question, the before I leave category. Yes, I like categories. Um, <coughs> you, you've, you've mentioned your sexuality as being fluid. Can you go into more detail on this? And if this has had any effect on certain scripts you've written? Oh, you know, I'm also a big fan of eroticism. So, you know, oh, that, yeah. that know. Is very present. I know that. Yeah. Lips and chains. Um, so, you know, I just, it's, it's very simple. As of right now, I'm very into women. That's all I know. All I know right now. I don't know where I'll be in 10 years. I don't know where I'll be in 15 years. I don't know what that's going to happen. So, um, you know, that's kind of the way I view it. Um, Mr. O, tell us, why don't you tell us about your kids in Mexico? Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Yeah. No, God, no, I don't have kids. But, um, yeah. Um, what was the second part of it again, bro? Go ahead and say that. Get stupid, Eric. You just made me forget. You, you've mentioned your sexuality as being fluid. Can you go into more detail on this? And if this has had any effect on certain scripts you've written? Um. So the scripts, this is really the first one where I really tackle sexuality. Like, because it was an assignment for my class. But have you have you had previous ideas and scripts that have, might have gone into this territory? Yes. Final kiss. Um, unfilmed right now is capped at 45 pages. 
Uh, it is about a woman who is going to Mexico to spend all her money and kill herself after being divorced, after div being divorced from her husband and losing everything in her life. And she falls in love with a woman at a hotel and it's a hybrid horror film. And it's a, it's, it's a really crazy movie, but um, you know, I also have the idea of writing up, you know, an LGBTQ film through the perspective of a man because um, in, in our community, like that's so, you know, that's, no, no one ever makes films about men, gay men. I mean, Moonlight is one of the greatest movies ever made. No, what it concentrates on there is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I have not seen that. Few and far between life. movies do that. I, few and far between. And I have not seen that in my culture. So I really would like to get in there into about that in, 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 a, in about that. But um, I, I, so yeah, so just kind of two scripts. I've really, you know, this one, of course, in Final Kiss, I've really gone into the idea of sexuality. Now, now Final Kiss, you said you capped at 45 pages. Could you see maybe make that into a full oh, yeah. film? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to expand it. Okay. I'm trying to expand it, yeah. Uh, it's capped at 45 for the draft for draft number three right now, but I'm going to keep writing more. Okay. Because yeah. that, that does sound like a good one to expand into a full film. Yeah. That's something that I want to pitch to Blumhouse mm -hmm. or possibly, you know, fucking, what's it called? Um, Jordan Peele's Monkey Paw production. So, you know, because that, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's the best thing about horror films. You can make them on a dollar budget and sell them for a hundred millions. <laughs> yeah. It's going more about myself. Yeah. Yeah. Give us your tax records. Why hide them? Yeah. My tax records. Funny thing about the tax records. Um, I don't know if we're supposed to put our, I don't think, you know, anchor would have told us by now, right. That we were supposed to put that shit on our taxes. Right. Like, I, I mean, uh, I think at a certain point, like if you're making thousands of dollars on anchor, yeah, you got to put that on. But if you're only making like a few hundred here and there, yeah. I think it's less. I yeah. think the government's going to be like, yeah. Because our strife dashboard supposed to, you know, have an actual, you know, tax document for but, us. But Luis is right. Let's not get into this. We're, we're <laughs> stick on the subject roll. I mean, I'm saying that. That's um, all right. Now we go on to um, what I'm a part of. That's the podcast network. Yeah. In regard to the nerd core, what is your true opinion on this whole journey? And what would you like to see come from it? Um, my opinion on this journey is that it's been a long one, but it hasn't felt that long. Um, it's also a journey that if I could start it over tomorrow, I'll start it over. And I want to do it again because I truly love what we've got here. I love what we've done. I love the community that we're building every single day. It's probably one of the most satisfying journeys I've ever had. You know, I, I, I would do this again in a heartbeat. 1000%. Where, where, where do I want this to lead? I mean, it's, 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 it's no, it's no secret, bro. We've said it up. You said it a thousand times. You're like, oh, who's going to get to the point where he's directing films and he's not going to be able to do this. So, you know, do you, do you think that's true, though? Do you think you, you would be like, nah, I'm not going to talk to Brad ever? I think I'd be reduced to the monthly position. But, um, Brad, that's, but, um, you, I, know, you know what's bad? We can't kick him off here. Yeah, I know. We can't. <laughs> I think that it's where I want this to go is for me to find the pers a person who believes in this as much as I believe in this. And it might just be you and I can pass those keys on to you and you can take care of this and I can come in like once a month or twice a month to do something and I can just direct my films. I think that's the end game that I'm slowly creating something for the benefit of someone who's at the bottom right now who will really need it. Well, and I hope that's 10 years down the road. 10 oh, years. Because yeah, I, I, or more, because I really enjoy talking to you on the daily. Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. And I, I don't think we'll ever stop talking. I just think that like this, 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 I would love for this to live on forever. But that's wishful thinking. Because the career I want, and I know the career that you want me to achieve this will take a back burner to it. Which I, I've always known starting this. 
Yeah. Your, your dream is to be a film director. Mm -hmm. And I think this interview has quite proven that, but any moments I get where you're focused on the podcast and if we can get this podcast to the point where, you know, yeah, maybe you come on once a month, say, Hey Brad, how you doing? You yeah. know, maybe that's good enough. Yeah. I mean, fuck, if we can make it into a whole fucking radio station thing, then fuck yeah, you know, yeah, you know, love that. But, you know, eventually it's going to get to the point in my career where I'm going to have to put this aside for a bit. And if we can just come back twice a month for you and I to do something together, I'll take it. But like the, the, the end game to me is just to create something for, 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 for everyone to benefit from. So I create this network and it gives the opportunities for those who are coming up in this world. So, well, what we maybe even think about is we may take a back burner to the new generation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, I, that's about right. That's that about, sounds right. about right. Because the early years of podcasting is just a bunch of white dudes, bro. And you know, it just, yeah, the quota, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, now, now it's diversifying and we're really much, we're pretty much, I, I just always thought of it. I don't want to overstate my welcome, bro. I don't want to overstate my welcome. And I want to, um, I, I want to bring, I want to make something for people to reap benefits. Like I reaped my benefits for. And, um, I, I, I see that my special guest is in the waiting room. I I'm see that too. Yes. Guys. Um, it is with my utmost, um, you know, Fuck it, I don't know how to say it. Uh, the person who has been there for the longest, one of the longest times, a person that I cherish with all my heart, someone who I love with every fiber of my being. Uh, her name is Ellie. She's here. And um, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening, squad? Yes, um, Ellie. Welcome. Yeah. This is the this is the um, this is the interview show that we're doing because we hit the funding on our goal for our film. And Hold on. Uh, I'm like my mic is like acting so janky. Hold on. Yeah. I'm like the like unprofessional one on a phone. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That's how we started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she fucking on, knows, bro. She knows. She was I'm the angry. one. Huh? Hold on. I'm rejoining because this is right. bad. This is okay. janky. Okay. Give me a minute. Yeah. Gotta love it. It, it, it wouldn't be a nerdcore podcast without technical difficulties. No, <laughs> I, just, I want to create a, a platform that others could benefit from, like I have. Well, and that, I, I think that's what you started from from the beginning, even when I first stepped foot into the to the mm -hmm. podcast network. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, oh my god, I think that's better. Okay, yep, that's better. better. So, um. That's better. I, I could not do this episode without bringing this person on because um, I God, I have to go back to our history and how we oh met. Oh, boy. We're yeah. talking like eight years. Yeah. Um, I joined Twitter in 2011. Um, we started following each other like late 2011, early 2012, around the same time that I, that I met Brad. I met Brad over there. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. This person has been through it all. Um, she, what's it called, uh, was there for a lot of things. I mean, what's it called? The reason I got through my first year of college was because of Ellie. Um, because we of the were like, weren't, we were like still in high school back in the day. Wasn't that, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. Like we're old. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, you're gonna make not, them mad. You're not gonna really, make them not mad. really. <laughs> so you know, but Ellie is the reason why I got through my first year of college. Um, Ellie was the first person who gave me support on getting on medication. Um, she has seen the beautiful, the beautiful stuff in my life. She's seen the ugly stuff in my life. So I could not bring her i could not do this without her this episode because if this is an episode detailing my life a big part of that life is because of this woman who's down here um i met her through the internet 
I, we have never met a single day, even though there was times where we were possibly going to make it happen. And then things got, you know, the economy, you know, the money, you know, was always an issue. And now, and now COVID, now COVID, uh, an issue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. TwitchCon, TwitchCon. <laughs> yeah, Twitch, <laughs> TwitchCon. I mean, it, it, it's not even just TwitchCon. Just possibly, what's it called? Ellie hitching a ride down here. What's Houston. crazy? <laughs> what's crazy? It's like we haven't even video chatted in a while. Like yeah. it's been a while. Well, it's you know, crazy. I'm busy with a motherfucker right now. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Schedule, schedule like, just I, doesn't fit in. Schedule doesn't like, fit. Do you see me? I just like I was like speeding to get, yeah. <laughs> to get home from work. Yeah, and I look like I've been crying, which maybe I have. But. Yeah, it's okay. I was crying earlier. That's so, okay. Most of us in here have been. Yeah. <laughs> Why? So I, I, we we started talking about my grandma. So you know, yeah. we, what's it called? We started talking about that, and I got emotional here. But um, I so I could not do it. I could not bring. I could not do this episode without bringing Ellie on. So I've only. I'm, I'm going to have you in here for just a bit. Okay. Because we're going to continue on with the show and doing it. I wanted to let you get your questions in, but also talk about, you know, um, how, well, first of all, like, like how you got to know me, how, how you've got to, how you've gotten to know me. And if I can say there's one person except my family who knows me better, this woman down here is the one who, crazy. this I, woman here knows me better than I may know myself. And it's crazy because like over the years, we've been so busy. And we don't talk every, like, we used to talk, like, text each other and call each other hourly, hourly when we were going through it. And lately, over the years, because we're both doing so much, it's more so, like, once a week nowadays. But it's, like, it we're still as close as ever, which is insane. And it could be literally just like a hey what's up how are you and it still like eases like all the hard stuff that i go through every day and that's just mm -hmm. like the connection that we've had mm -hmm. which is it's just crazy like to talk about mental health and what all we've been through together back in 2016 i remember getting very very sick and at that point, my mental health was so bad that I, my first like thought was just ending it all. And you came in and was like the logical connection that I needed where you were like, no, we need to figure this out. You need to get help. And you helped me narrow down the symptoms, narrow down like what it could be. And you are the reason why. I'm now cancer free, which is crazy. And like living health, like healthily, like, which is like insane. You wouldn't expect someone that I met off Twitter to have like done that. That's insane. And, and, and we didn't get into this, Brad, but what's it called? One of the biggest hardships of my life. Um, I remember the day vividly. I was getting down to, um, to my second university that I was going to. Um, I get a text and it's okay if I tell you, if I, I remember these texts vividly, I don't have them anymore, but I remember exactly what, what those texts said. Can you, can I say them? Absolutely. Ellie, Ellie texted me and she said, um, um, Raul, where are you? I goes, uh, if I'm going to tell you something, please don't freak out. Let's go. I don't want you to freak out. Um, I don't want you to, what's it called? Uh, to do what's it called? Uh, get, you know, emotional and stuff. First of all, my first thought is whatever it is, how the fuck fucking dare you tell me not to be emotional? <laughs> I was like, sit down for this one, bud. Sit down for this one. Um, and she, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm good. All right, what, what's going on? Ellie gives me the news that she um, has um, cancer. Uh, it's in her stomach, right? Yep. And uh, my body goes completely numb. I, the only person that I had, and it's the reason why Luis, I love Luis with all the bottom of my heart because I called him and I told him, Hey man, I know you don't have class today. I do have class today. I'm not going to go to class. Can you please come pick me up? Uh, one of my best friends just told me she has cancer. 
Louise picked me up. We spent the whole day together at his house, watching movies, watching TV. And I cry on the car ride to Louise's house because, first of all, when you hear cancer, the first thing you think about is that the person is going to die. Exactly. And I could not afford to lose this person down here at all. Um, you know, it's an understatement to say that I love Ellie. What's it called? I, I love her with all my heart. More than anything in this world. I don't mention this woman a lot on the show. I don't mention it a lot anywhere. But the sheer um, importance that she holds in my life and the part that she holds in it and everything that she has been able to push me through to get to here. The reason I created a podcast was not just because of Luisa's, what's it called, help. I went to her. I told her, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And you're like, you can do it. This is great. You, this is something you can do. I was so stoked. I was so stoked. I was like, you got this. I, yeah. When I told her I wanted to do filmmaking, because I wanted to make movies, and she would watch my, she's probably the only person who remembers the YouTube videos I made, even though, the, what's it called, they're, they're oh, gone now. Goodness. And he was like, you're talented. You, you have something in this. You can do something. And I'm, like, I'm a hard ass. Like, I, like, yeah. I'm obviously, like, I'm in the music industry. I know all these people. And I, I could be fake and be like, yeah, no. Like, mm -hmm. but to everybody else, I'm, I'll tell them if, like, I, I'll tell people if I don't like it. Yeah. And that happens a lot. And so. Like, you know, I'm an honest person. Yeah, you are. And so you're the one person that, like, I have known that has got it. Like, it's insane. <laughs> it's um, and if there is one person, Brad, I, I very much care what you think, bro, about my films. Don't get no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> Let's get that right you now. Lie. <laughs> lie. The first person I ever send my work to. Is her. It's the first person who gets it. I'm sorry to those of you who backed we the project and everything. Yeah. A lot. What's it called? Who backed the we project like on, on the yeah. She's going to be the first person who watches before I leave when it gets finished. She's probably going to see the footage I make before it is ever released. Like, so the director's cut. She sees the director's cut. She sees everything that comes into the footage. What's it called? The, the road to making this happen. She's going to be the first one to see that. I just feel glad that you said that I could go to con and eat Doritos and drink like Miller Lite. <laughs> it is. What? But you just, I had to bring her on because to understand who I am, a big part of it is to understand the impact that she's had. So I wanted to give you the chance to ask at least one or two questions. Who, really, me? yeah, no questions. Just, yeah. I brained that after work. I just came to hang out, dog. I, I know you did. Just I know. Cool. You did. Um, yeah, and he's giving you homework. See how he is. <laughs> but, um, he like so I guess me the other day and was like, "Hey, I want you on the show," and I was like, "Oh yeah, absolutely." Like it's yeah, about time been... you asked me. I was getting offended. <laughs> I'm planning to do an interview like this with you. Okay. You're on, you, All you're right, on. Yeah. Give me, I'll need homework because like I said, I yeah. just worked like, I just walked like yeah, six no. or seven miles at work and I am actually like, so then I'll, I'll get to the table. I won't huh. let you ask me something. I'll, I'll ask you something. But, but before we get into that, you literally have not invited her to the live show. Really? You invite everyone to the live show. Exactly. <laughs> You're gonna I put me under the bus, here, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> I am. I'm the host. Yeah, he like knows that I'm like the most inappropriate person ever. Wait, like, hold on, honey. Honey. No, yeah. no, we found a few others. <laughs> no, we found a few <laughs> others. <laughs> One's in chat right now, right, Ada? Yeah, two are in chat right now. <laughs> oh My yeah, both of them. <laughs> yeah. It's a party. Uh, I guess I'll ask you a question, even though it's kind of weird for me to ask the question about myself, but um. I'll ask you this. What was the moment that you, that you knew that the relationship that we have, friendship, or even more than that, 
then you knew that it was very much about how we both, you know, benefit each other and how much we both really need each other. Gosh, I would say 2015, back back when like kick was cool. That was like our thing was kick. Do you remember yes, those days? Yes, Do you remember those days? I remember that was when we were both going through a hard time. Yeah. It was like summer 2015. And they were just just about every night we stayed up all night text just messaging on kick. Well shit, I couldn't probably sleep. Like four nights a week, probably. Like and we were we would be up to like six AM just consistently messaging. Like thousands of messages. And that was 2015 through 2016 was a really hard time in my life. And no, like when you get diagnosed with cancer, you have everyone saying, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. But I remember waking up from my first surgery and the one person who was there and was texting me and calling me. I, you FaceTimed me the second I said I was out of surgery. Mm-hmm. You, you actually were there. FaceTimed me. Did I? Yeah. We, I was in the library working on That's the like short film. Short, I'm working on the short film. You FaceTimed me on my laptop and I told my friend that I was working on it with, dude, I need to take this call. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I have people that I've known since I was like little, like family friends that it didn't matter if they weren't there. Like, like you were, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, It's just, it's hard to explain. But like I said, I like solely, like, I will stand behind the statement that, like, I would not be alive without you today. Like, without you being there for me, I would not be alive. You you getting emotional in here? No. Oh, I have too, I have on too much mascara to cry. <laughs> if anybody knows anything about Ellie, like she fucking does have makeup like a motherfucker, dude. Like, it's not today. I was like, I am not putting in the effort today. Yeah. yeah. Um. So... Yeah, uh, and and you know likewise that that's the same sentiments I give you, because there is no way that I am who I am today without you. Um, I mean, there was a lot of things like you know people that I was around at that time, who Ellie was quick to say, "They're not good for you. They're not good for you. They're gonna. They're, it's it's gonna end up really bad. You're not gonna like this." Let's go. It's going to end up at a really bad thing. And I was like, oh, fuck. No, you know, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I'm going to be all right. Uh, and then you're angry. Yeah, and you're, you're like, fucking Raul, Raul, you're not, you're, you're not seeing it. It's right listen there. to me. Listen to me. Raul, this person is not right. It's it's not the, you yeah. shouldn't have to be going through this. And Ellie was, Ellie was always right about a lot of things. We had a lot of tough love. Over yeah. this. I mean, on top of cancer right before that like I was diagnosed in the fall of 2016 I the whole summer of 2015 is when I went into deep alcoholism Mm -hmm. and you stood by me a lot of people didn't Mm -hmm. that's yeah yeah and we came to the like you were the person to tell me like hey you're being stupid like you need to get yourself together woman that sounds like role. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, what are you doing baby yeah because I mean you, you you look at it I didn't want to lose you you know I didn't want you to you know because you were starting to drive I was like don't oh and um, you know you, you were heading down a road and I saw myself heading down the same road and you were telling me the same thing and you were like yeah and it was hard for me like it's hard to listen to yourself because yeah like you can mm-hmm. tell someone like hey don't drink don't drink don't do this don't do that but it's hard to take that advice for yourself mm-hmm. yeah so it meant a lot to hear from her as she probably thought it meant a lot to hear from me to tell you can't be going doing this you know yeah you know and 
it's gotten there to that point where we were just uh, the help that we both needed. And she said, she's saying the truth, man. We don't talk like we used to, but every single text. And, and I, and I do need to call you more often. I, I That's have right. That's yeah, right. I, I know. Baby. I know. I gotta talk. I gotta call you more often. You know, it's look, if, if, if you understand how busy it is right now, like oh, yeah. it's the, it's the second to last semester. I'm almost done. You know, you're going to be at the graduation, you know, oh, yeah, you're right. I need to start planning that trip. Actually. Yeah. And even then, if you can't, you know, we're, we're, no, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna but I, I, I say that because we don't know how things will be with the virus, you know, how, yeah, how when is that actually? I graduate spring 2021, so it'll probably I'm in. I'm like in. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm in. Say no more. Spring break. Honey. Yeah. But I'm. She is a very part, big part of what this the episode has to be. So, Brad, if you want to ask her something before she has to leave, and we get back to you, just you and me. Even though I would love for her to stick around. But you I know. gotta, I gotta take a big fat nap after getting. Oh, off. I, to say shit. I, I thought she was gonna, gonna say dump too. Yeah. yeah I she was gonna say <laughs> Yeah. That's it. I, really <laughs> I mean, some of the some of the most cherished moments of my life with Ellie was just text her and be like, "Yeah, so I'm taking a shit." And you're like, "Oh yeah, me too." Yeah, you know, <laughs> or like even even when when she was diagnosed and she was going through, she's like, "He goes," she would say, "I wish I could shit like you." Like, I cannot shit like <laughs> you. I can't. I can't. And it's probably one some of the darkest humor you just hear right now because of that. But it's the truth. Like Ellie was just like, "I wish I could poop like you." Like, yeah, like I, I had. To, like clarify that I had my intestines taken out. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She was like, "Oh, you poop like five times a day." I wish I could be like that with you right now. Like, I wish I could be you. Me be like, I just ate ice cream, and like everybody knows this boy's lactose intolerant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So bad. Like, oh. <laughs> so yeah. Cool. It's supposed to be a serious, but here we're talking about shit. All right, Brad, you want to ask her something? It always devolves into. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's the whole motto and the whole, you know, stick of this show. You want to ask this amazing woman something before she leaves? Keep it clean. <laughs> whoa, whoa, <right. laughs> The funny thing is, Brad, um, Ellie knows you because I'm pretty sure Ellie. I follow you- her on Instagram. Hold on. Wait, I do, do I follow you I, back? I think so. Oh, am I mean? Do no. I so, no. Hold on. Hold Not on. Ellie, <laughs> like, sure. I am sure that you bought something from Till back in the day. This is local love. You bought something from This is local Yo, love. Oh, what? No uh, way. Yeah, I'm that Brad. Wow. <laughs> that Brad. We like, that's crazy. That was mm-hmm. a long time ago. Yeah, yes. I bet I have something fucking somewhere. Yeah. I like, yeah. Do you probably I, remember when I was just constantly on Twitter? That's all I did. <laughs> oh, wait. Did you guys meet through Twitter also? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. When did you guys meet? Same About the same year. time. 2011, no, 2012. I'm almost... Did he follow me first? Till followed me first. Mm-hmm. Then we Probably. started talking consistently. I think I talked to you like a few times, like back in the day. Yeah. And like you were like the two people I talked to on there. And so yeah. it just ended up like overlapping. That's crazy. Yeah. Holy yeah. Holy shit. That, that's what Till did. That, that's why oh. I enjoy Till is it just made a lot of relationships. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, I need to get back on Twitter. I haven't used Twitter in forever. Oh, you're good. Don't come back. You're good. Don't come back. (laughs) It it hasn't got any better. It hasn't hasn't got any better. It will never be as good as 2000. As back then, like yeah, like I got away with a lot of shit. Back going. Yeah, don't go back. You're you're good on Instagram. You're great on Instagram. Yeah, just just don't come back because it's it's a hellhole. (laughs) Yeah, just like Facebook. Fuck! I don't know why I, I I stay on Facebook, man. But, I don't know either. I, I I haven't posted anything in Facebook for like three years. I it took Brad like months for him to add me back when I added him, and I was I like, like, "No, bro, we're in business together." I love having Facebook because it's like a mixture of like 
people that I know across mm-hmm. all these all the states and then it's also a mixture of like my family and I just wild out on there like post mm-hmm. post the nipples and hey our, our views just went up by 20 though don't add me because you heard me say that yeah don't add her don't me. <laughs> that's a call that yeah yeah let's be let's call that <laughs> No man should ever be protective of another woman, but let's just say I'm very protective of it. <laughs> so he's like, no he's one... commenting on my post, like where I'm just posing half naked. He's like, delete this shit right now. <laughs> no, 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 I, no, no. Actually, I, I, what's, I very much what's called uh, I, 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 you should definitely do it. But I'm just saying, if y'all go ask her for titty, you'll, y'all better be ready to pay for titty. I'm telling Damn you that right. right now. Damn right, high mm, price. Baby. Make that money. All right, Brad, go ahead and ask her her question. So Give me a good okay. one, and then I'm taking a nap. So when you finally meet Raul in person, what is the first thing you're going to say? Can I say, I'm probably just going to beat his ass, no words, for no reason. Hey, same. <laughs> hey, same. Motherfucker, why didn't you meet earlier? <laughs> like that's been what i've said for like the past eight years is that i was just gonna stunner this dude through a fucking building <laughs> no well, i'm not lying <laughs> i'm not lying when i said that ellie's been through a lot of the phases um when i was first gonna come to houston um i was planning to train with this backyard federation for wrestling holy shit and remember that ellie was gonna come to one of my to the shows where i was supposed to do it and she even, she even, what's it called? Um, she even had planned this thing like, no, I want to become a wrestler at one point. She was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. How about you do this bit where I have a beer and I, and I, and you take it from me and you, I just throw it right in your face. I'm not supposed to be heal. So like, Ellie was the one who pitched that and like, we can start our like little, you know, or like, what's oh it my God, I remember those days. And I was like, you're, you're right. Like, I'd be like, cut me a promo. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> Yeah. It makes so, good. Yeah. So I'm I'm pretty sure that if Ellie were to meet, like when we meet, like Ellie will 100 percent beat my ass. But at the same time, Me. I think the beat my yes, ass. Sir. Will, Look at that. Look at the muscles. Yeah. 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 I think first of all, I think Ellie's gonna probably give me one of the tightest hugs I'll ever get in my life. Oh yeah. And then after that, she'll probably beat the shit out of me. Yeah. That, you're used to that though. Oh yeah, I very much, I very much enjoy it too. So you know, it's okay. Whoa. Oh God! Whoa. Oh God! That's my cute old lady. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. You know me. Um. So yeah. Um. That's that's gonna be your answer. The best thing is that I'm shorter than you. Mm-hmm. So oh, like, mm-hmm. perfect fucking hugging, bro. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect fucking hugging. That's right. Very fucking hugging. I I I gotta I gotta I'll text you after we're done here. And- All right. Yeah. I'm. This needs to go. This yeah. No, to let's go. let's set up a time to call each other because I I do yeah. want to go back. I yeah, I'm busy as a motherfucker, but I'm gonna make it. You know. Let's 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 talk to each other again on the phone and stuff like that. Deal. Deal. I actually I need you to text me your address because I got your Christmas present. Santa's. Oh. Santa's coming to your house early. Yeah, mm. ladies, if you want to know how to get to your to my heart, buy me stuff like she just did right now, like wrestling stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, Ellie. Thank, right. You. Um, thank you, Ellie. Hold on, before you leave, before you leave, they should one hundred percent see the work that you do because you're an incredible photographer. You're an incredible model. Where can they follow you? Elks Morgan on Instagram. E L K. S Morgan. I'm not spelling out that Morgan. You don't know how it's spelled. It's Morgan, like Captain Morgan, Donna. damn it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to spell that, you dumb. <laughs> and with that, I bid you all farewell. Have a good night. Bye, guys. Yeah. Love you. Thank you. All right. Now let's go back, Brad. Let's go back. Let's. I'm glad that we were able to do that. I didn't think that she was going to be able to do it. But then again, who am I to doubt her? She's going to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out where I left off. Um, You're talking about, you know, where the podcast would end and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. What has been your favorite moments from the podcast? 
<laughs> um, one of my favorite moments has just been every time. So I think there's been like a total of 10 episodes that I accidentally delete. And they're like, <laughs> hey man, I actually lost these. We don't have an episode this week. But one of my favorite episodes, one of my favorite moments of the episode is every time we bring someone to the show that originally has never done this before. I mean, you just saw it right now. She's a natural. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why I was questioning. Why have you not invited her to the live show? She's so busy. She's so busy. But like that's, I said, that, that ain't no reason. Everybody busy. Yeah. But we're, we're in COVID times. Everybody in the house. Yeah. Like I said, so like we bring somebody who's never done this before and they completely blow us out of the water and they're like, wow, you should be doing this. Well, we, we've had moments. Uh, we've had many moments. Ashley being one, Jabril, Aiden, um, Gio, Luis, Michelle. Like, you know, I, I, I and I always say this, me and you, yeah, we can do a show. We've proven that before. We did it for many years, just us. But it's much more fun when we can get the cast on, be it Shane or anyone. Because between us, yeah, we got a good rapport. But once you throw in a little bit, someone third in there, it just becomes a little bit more chaotic in a way. And you throw in another and That's a little right bit. And then, and then we just like, fuck it, throw Eric in there and just like, all right. <laughs> So I, those are my favorite moments to me. And also the moments where I'll bring up a film that I'm really into and you'll just absolutely fall in love with it. You know, Babel, Taste of Cherry. Um, oh, you know, Taste of Cherry was my first time. I'm sorry. Babel. But I think that those are also your favorites when you first brought in Ikidu and you're like, oh, man, I hope he likes this one. I hope he likes this one. And then I ended up loving it. It's one of my favorites. And uh, I think when we when we share that, that 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 because the show is created because of our love of cinema. Mm -hmm. So when we both share in that love and in that very beautiful feeling that only the cinema can create, only the uh, only the art of cinema can create. Those are my favorite parts. Yeah. I mean, I, I I don't disagree. I also got to bring up Chill Zone. I think mm -hmm. Chillzone has been a major part in this because without him, I don't think the Twitch part stuff would not at all be there. You have a lot of people rampantly saying a lot of things in that chat that we couldn't. And Eric fighting all of them, uh -oh. even us. <laughs> but my favorite part of the, but my, but yeah, that and also just revolving us around with people who get us and get what we're doing here. Well, and it's amazing what you can do when. Uh, again, I, I, I bring up the environment of the podcast is it's always been there to people just to blow off steam and just mm -hmm. enjoy it. I, I mean, I, I loved when Bert came in and you could totally see he was having a blast. <laughs> Tamor, he was having a blast. And that's what I love to see. I don't like to I, I mean, the live show is not meant for serious topics. Sometimes we get into that but it really isn't meant for serious topics. That's where everybody, you know, that's, that's just the stupid hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just, that's what it is. And we have other shows. That, that's my favorite thing about what we've created here is that every single part of these shows is something that has to do. It's a little bit, a piece of us. Empire files is my love and my strange, odd, fascination with wanting to get to know people and understand what makes them them gamer core is our love of video games the the nerd core is our love of film and all that the nerd core live show is our love of being us and being who we are the cinema condition is my love of film theory and understanding you know the deeper meanings of the movies we watch and um you know there's like other stuff man it, it all kind of builds on and it's built through what makes us us? My favorite thing is the fact that we've been able to cultivate a network that is based on us. And that's, I, I mean, and that was from the very beginning. It was, you wanted to do that. You wanted to do that with Luis mm -hmm. in the beginning. 
And sometimes I question what that pod, what this podcast network would have looked like if Luis had been able to. Would I have been a third chair instead of a co-host? Yeah. Would and, and you know these things are all brought up, and I'm just happy to be here most days, you know. And that I, I'm just glad I was given the opportunity to come on here and just mm-hmm. talk with my friends. Yeah. You know, I I I, I think that if, if Luis would have stayed on, I think the show would have it, it would have been different, but you definitely would have been a third chair because uh I mean I, I was gonna move to Houston. Um, uh, you know, and I was gonna be there and I was gonna have to find what's it called a re- record remotely and stuff like that. So you know, uh, you we would have needed a third chair, and you would have been the third chair. Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. which would have been fine with. Uh, although I don't know if it would have been the same throughout. Mm-hmm. But anytime Luis is, is on, you know, we always had a good rapport. Like yep. we always get along. So much, so, so much fun. Um, going off that. Is there anyone you would specifically like to bring onto the podcast? We know Ellie now, of yeah. course. But is there like think big? Think big? Think big. Think big and then think me. <laughs> um oh, fuck. Um we brought RB3 onto the show. I brought Sabrina Ramirez onto the show. I'm gonna bring in Andres Cabrera into the show. So those three, I mean, I can't say those three. Um, if I go big, I will be a nervous wreck. It'll be tough for me. I, you say I, that every time. Yeah. You say that every time. Like when but you were that, on there with Sabrina and them, yeah. you said, dude, I was so nervous. Like yeah. couldn't tell. Understand like, when I say this name, I will be nervous. I would love to interview Alejandro Gonzalez Iñarito. No, oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> If you think I do prep for that, I would do the prep of a lifetime. I I mean, to sit down either next to that man or remotely next to that man and ask what I need to ask, it would be one of my biggest dreams of a lifetime. What would, what would be a question you would ask? What What's one that just comes right into your mind, what you would ask him? I, I would ask him about um, um, how, how it feels, how... Um, what 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 led him to want to seek out such ambitious projects like the ones he does? I mean, the man got a special Oscar for making a VR film. I mean, what's it called? That puts you in the shoes of an immigrant who's crossing over the border. I mean, you look at Babel. It's a very ambitious film. You have all these different storylines interconnecting with each other in some form or way. You know, his, a lot of his films are what's it called about, you know, these very ambitious. But I would ask him that. And I'd also ask him. I'd also ask him, um, um, what level um, of understanding of the human condition do you need to have to create such um, intimate bodies of work like he has? And um, you know, I, there's just a lot that I would ask him. You know, I'd ask him about being a young filmmaker in Mexico at a time where it was hard to be a young filmmaker. I'd ask him a lot about, you know, his life growing up and where his love of the film of the film industry came for. But I think the number one would be how um how 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 if how it how it um how it's possible to create such ambitious work in a in a in a what's it called in an industry that feels like it's progressing like at fifty miles per hour. Like you feel like you're gonna hit you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna climb onto something that will stick for years, but we barely have seen the rise of VR films at all. You know, it's a, it's a slow growing movement. And well, that's, that's been VR anyway. Yeah. VR really hasn't gotten big until kind of now. Yeah. If we're being honest and Mm -hmm. it's been around probably late seventies, early Mm eighties. Um, so if I had to see somebody medium, I mean, I've always said, I'm, I'm dying to talk to, um, um, what's the name? What's the name? That's, I mean, of course, John Roca. I'm dying to talk to John Roca about a lot of things, but um, I mean, what's it called uh, Dorina Arellano. Uh, I'm dying to talk to Dorina Arellano. Um, I want to talk to her about you know existentialism in film and 
a lot about you know existence and uh, mental health, but especially the uh, the idea of, of of our cultures and the way that it imp it improves and affects the way that our art is created. Uh, and, and because I I think that when I talk when I want to talk to somebody like her, I have to bring up our culture. I have to bring it up, and I re she's somebody who. I, I know it's not going to happen in 2020 because there's one ma month left in 2020. Next year, I would just love to sit down and talk to Dorina Arellano, whether it be on the, um, whether it be on the cinema condition or on the impaired files. I want to talk to her. I want to have an episode with her and I want to talk about a lot of these incredible things that um, are mowing around in my mind. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, this just came into my mind. This is on my list, but yeah. Is there, a certain show that's not on the podcast that you eventually want to see. Um, I eventually want to see on this podcast for network. Um, I, I, I would love for us, um, to see, um, well, you know, I'm always looking for more diversity, but you know, um, we, I think you can agree with me when I say you can only create the same show twice you know you like it's like let's be honest let's go luis has a very very busy life mm -hmm. but the nerdy chicano show is what the nerdcore live show is now it really is let's be real that, that's that true is what it is now so i if there's a show that i want to see on here i i would i would like to see um a a show in a different language, an all Spanish show in Spanish, an all show in French, an all show in Italian or something like that. You know, a show that concentrates on whatever topic they want to talk about, but it is distributed in the primarily in a foreign language. Wow. And it that, is that's pretty ambitious, actually. Yeah. 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 And hopefully there's subtitles. <laughs> well, you know, a transcript, like <laughs> something, something that I can read. I know you ain't gonna have subtitles, bro. Yeah, but um, I, I would like to um, you know, do that, and um, primarily, I, I, I would like to see it from uh, people of color. So um, I'm always taking pictures, guys. Talk to me. Yeah, really are. <laughs> Um. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's it for the podcast section. Um, uh, I guess to end this, I have two questions. It's very well, long. So <laughs> I told you it's going to be two over two hours. We knew that. Oh, we knew. Uh, so for for the first question, do you have a secret talent? Um. Um. So I don't think anybody knows this. Um, I was in Taekwondo from like six, like sixth grade to like. Eighth, I don't remember too well. Uh, I did that, so I can I can manage to almost put my leg behind my back, my head, back of my head. Well, we've seen the foot thing, so yeah, you could imagine, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we've seen the foot thing, so yeah. All right, um, ladies, he's flexible. Yeah, uh, I almost I I I I knew how to play guitar. I don't know anymore. Um. What else? What else? What, um, what, was it finger picking or just with a pick? The pick. Finger picking too. Um, I would like to learn accordion. Uh, would like that. Um, as many, I mean, Brad knows that I used to write music. I used to write music. What's it called? Uh, I used to want to be a musician. Um, but secret talent that I, I don't know, bro. Uh, if you would have asked me in two thousand. 15, my secret talent was that I could probably do this more than likely. Uh, but I, I don't know if there's anything about me that I would consider to be, you know, um, a secret talent. Um, I, I don't know. I, I like, I just think about the photo b behind the head for sure. I can do that. And now, now you brought up uh, writing music. Mm -hmm. Would you score your own movies? In the future, if I learned piano, if I learned all of that stuff, if I could score my own music, I could score it. But like I said, a lot of what I want to do in my career is to give that opportunity for people out there 
So I want somebody else to do it, you know, somebody to do it. So that way they can have the opportunity. I don't want to take over everything. I barely feel comfortable wanting to write the scripts that I direct. So, so you don't want to be a Kurosawa? No, no, no. I, that, I want to give everybody. That's probably good because that man was crazy. Yeah, I want to <laughs> give everybody an opportunity, bro. Um. Well, I'm run. The, I'm down to my last question, roll. So I think I think we've gone quite long, and we've gone into a lot of stuff. Um. Before I get to my final question, is there anything I missed that you would like to talk about? I mean, we could always do it on the after hours, but we uh, could always do that. Like, yeah. but that's that's a certain topic. So keep that topic locked away that you want to talk yeah. about. Um, you didn't ask a lot about my culture, bro. And really, what it was? I, I, I brought up like different stuff yeah. of the culture. But really, why I why I'm why my culture is so important to me, and why? But I think that that's a really good um that's a really good after hours uh topic, and really the um living in the border, living on the border. I mean, I didn't but, really think of that because I also live on the border. So yeah, I know. It wasn't one of those things where. Yeah, and I, I, I guess we could. Well, yeah, but you, you think about it like not a lot of people live in a neighborhood and wake up on their way to school and seeing like six people being cuffed with an immigration truck yeah. pulled over. So like not a lot of people see those things. So, you know, it was it would have been an interesting route to really talk about why that affected why I have the stances I do in my life. Which, you know, we probably get into that in the after hours as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Other than that, um, I mean, you know, I, I think you've kind of hit a lot of it, man. You hit about my love of film, my, my mental health, my family, the importance of what that means to me. You obviously, we got the chance to hear from somebody who is a big part of the reason that my life is at the moment that is a part where I'm at right now. Um, you know, that she's she was a big, she's a big part of it. So I, I think that overall you've kind of gotten everything and it's quite interesting because we didn't have to do a two part to this. <laughs> See, but, um, yeah. Um, but if I could, if I could be real honest with you, man, um, if I could bring somebody on the impaired files and I, and I'm going to do it, um, I, I would like to um, I would like to uh, to interview my grandparents before they die, the two that are living right now. So, my maternal grandmother, my maternal grandfather, and my paternal grandmother. And in and, and, and bloodlines, you did interview your grandfather, but my he grandfather. didn't want to be on camera. But, but I'm talking about like you know, sit down and actually talk with each other, and for a long form about his life and what. Because I've gotten the stories, I gotten a lot of them. So I would like to uh, immortalize his story on a long form interview like this. Do you think he'd be on camera or would he just do a recording? I think we'd be down for just a recording. Cause I don't think he wants to do camera. Okay. It was hard to convince him to do that. one. Hmm. I noticed that while watching it. Well, like, my, my he grand- must not want to been on camera at all. <laughs> my grandmother, she would, she wouldn't mind being on camera, but my, uh, my grandfather, I think that he's a little bit camera shy. Understandable. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, um, I I would love to say that I have time, but we never know if we have time for that. So it's something that I'll get, get to work on. And also, like, at one point, I would like to talk to my parents, you know, interview them as well. But, you know, I think for sure my grandparents immortalize them on this show and really, you know, talk to them. Oh, well, that takes me to the last question of anyone you want to shout out before we end this thing. Oh man. Um, I want to shout out my, 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 of course, the, the woman that gave me life, my, my mother, um, shout out my father, um, my brothers. Uh, I shout out Ellie. Uh, I shout out you. Um, uh, the people who come on the show all the time, Michelle as well. Shout out her. Luis. Um, I, I shout out Luis because, um, I'm not well, Luis, Luis, Luis G Garcia, by the way, uh, Luis, I love you, bro. Yeah. The one that's in chat right now. I love you, bro. But you know, uh, Luis G, um, it's hard to get her. It's hard to get along with me and it's hard to get along with me when, um, I'm on my moods because of my mental health. Luis has stuck through it all. Um, 
I, I will not lie and say that there was a point, a point where Luis and I probably would have t- traded blows with each other. Um, Understandable. But through it all, we remain friends, really close friends. And uh, I think that that's in part because I don't sugarcoat for Luis. I tell it to him how it needs to be, and he's the same way with me. It's like, I think part of being a good friend is realizing when your friends are fucking up. So um, I, I thank Luis for that. I shout him out for that. Um, I'll, sh- I'll shout out our, our, our Patreon supporters. Um, uh, I, I shout out my, uh, my what's it called? Uh, I shout out uh, everybody who has ever watched a, a, a watched a video, watched a, uh, listened to a podcast, watched my short film. And of course I shout out my, uh, my, my, my grandfather as well, who passed in 2012. And I'll shout out my grandmother who raised me. <clears throat> Well, with that role. Mm-hmm. Oh, and even more. Um, I shout out every single fucking person who ever said I wouldn't be able to do this. And I that I would not get far. Whoever, whoever looked at me and they thought that I would not be able to get to where I am because of my disability. Or every person who told me that it was better to stay in engineering. Every single person who looked at me and only saw me for the two-dimensional person that I am. I shot you out because you're all, all of you are the people that I can't wait to prove fucking wrong. I think you already have. <laughs> mm-hmm. And let me tell you, and I've said it about once, once, once over once, and I'll say it again. The reason that I keep doing this is because I love it. But also, I am not preoccupied with winning. I'll lose 20 times in a year, and I'm fine with that. Because I know I'm going to win in five or six years. So, anybody who sees my work and only thinks it's because of a short-term thing I've done, I'll tell you this, I shout you out because you have no idea how I work and you have no idea how it works in my head, I'm planning for things way in the fucking future. All Mm. right. And with that, I think we're done. As always, you can follow me at the Nerd Chicano on both Instagram and Twitter. Go to beforeileafilm.com. We're in the last days of our fundraiser. And I want to thank you all for coming on. I want to thank you all so much for what's called chatting with us. This very long episode, it will be available on the replay for all of us. Uh, what's it called? But once I go back to making the show, actually, you know, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, the show goes live and then it's available for a week. You're right. You heard that right. You heard that right. A week for patrons in podcast form. So um, you go ahead and go and do that. So um, without further ado, Brad, I usually, can I, can I say it, bro? Because this, that's my outro, and I haven't said this in a long time. I, I I will just say thank you to all those who tuned in today. Thank you to all those in chat. Thank you to all those who have supported this man as well as myself during these four to five years. It is appreciated, and to all the haters, I'll say what Raul said. We're going to prove you wrong either way. Mm-hmm. And with that, I'm out. Raul? <laughs> This has been the Impaired Files with the Nerd Chicano, and I would like to remind you all that the file is closed, but it's not classified. <laughs>